Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the City of Montpelier Development Review Board. My name is Daniel Richardson. I serve as the chair for this meeting, Monday, July 8th, 2019. The other members from my right are? Uh, Michael Lazorchak. Kevin O'Connell. Meredith Crandall, staff. Kate McCarthy. Rob Goodwin. All right, the first order of business is approval of the agenda. We have quite a full agenda this evening, um, but the uh, looks like there are one, two, three, four, five items of business. Anybody have any additions or changes? Hearing none, anyone want to make a motion that I will accept for approval of the agenda as printed? So moved. Motion by Kevin. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Rob. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. We have an agenda. No comments from the chair this evening. Other than I will note that um, we do have a full agenda and we will try and keep the, <coughs> excuse me, we do have a full agenda tonight and so we will try and keep the process moving forward um, and I will have more specific comments when we get to particular issues in which there may be applicants or people uh, seeking to oppose uh, or provide comment on some of the issues um, directly on that and to keep that moving. Um, but the last item of administrative business is review of the minutes from June 17th. Uh, myself, Kevin, Kate, Rob, and Michael were all in attendance. Uh, any corrections or changes to the minutes? No. Hearing none, do I have a motion to accept the minutes of June 17th? I'll make that motion. Motion by Kevin, do I have a second? Second. Second by Kate. All those in favor of the June 17th minutes, please raise your right hand. And we have approved minutes. Fantastic. Uh, just a note for our audience members, if you have a hard time hearing the applicant who will be at the table in the middle, that microphone is hooked up to a speaker that is on the back of that first post, so you actually will hear better if you move back a row if you're in the front row. First item of business is 106 East State Street, Gary and Allison Shy. And this is final subdivision review. Hello. Hello. Evening. So uh, I am going to put you under oath because this is uh, testimony. So if you'll raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give for the matter under consideration shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Okay. And I'm sorry, I act, forgot to ask you to introduce yourselves. Oh. Allison Shy and Gary Shy. Okay. So this is final subdivision review. Um, actually, I'm going to start with uh, Meredith. Do you have any comments uh, from the staff or any um, updates? I do, actually. So we do have written comments from Tom McCardle, Director of the Department of Public Works. Um, and let me pass. I sent those to Gary, didn't I? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's two more. Um, and he commented that, you know, the, the gist of it is that the applicants have installed the East State Street curbing as required as a condition of approval under a previous site plan, um, and that the only final work required there would be installing a pavement patch along the street. Um, otherwise, the Department of Public Works really didn't have any other concerns or technical review comments on the application at this point. Great. So, sorry to steal your thunder there, Gary. Um, we had the, we got the pavement done this afternoon. Okay. Yay. It was, that was a really good time. Yes. <laughs> we I've been, photos I've narrative. been trying to get people, okay. they're so busy, trying to piggyback off of other jobs and I was able to. It's completed. So, so Meredith, um, we took pictures and... Great. So I'm looking at the copy of the photo that shows the pavement patch, and this is really just the piece of pavement between the existing street and then new curbing that right. you've installed. Correct. Um, and I have to say the new curbing looks great. Thanks. Um, Thank you. We toyed over, should we make it look like the rest of the historic curb, or should we make it perfectly straight? <laughs> so <laughs> we went with the lines that were there, so. 
We're pleased with it too. I think all the tenants really like the way it looks. We have a yard now, so people are kind of excited. Um, I, the house, you can actually see it. We got everyone where they're supposed to be. Everyone is parking where they're supposed to, and it, that's so. Yeah, we're we're actually quite happy with it. Good, and that actually that is the I think the one other main piece of business that I want to make sure is on the record. Um, as far as the parking goes, so the four unit apartment building that's 106 mm -hmm. that's now going to be lot two. There, that has four spaces. On the map, I'm seeing that three of them are off street that from a common easement with with lot one, and then the fourth is straight off the street parking in front of the building at a garage. Is that correct? 106? Sorry, it's it's sorry, it's for that lot number like, two. Yeah, 108. Yeah. 108. Yeah, that parking garage, they can't pull in and park in there. It's right. made for cars like the the bracing. It's it's made it a for garage. a vehicle. Um, that's what it was used for before we bought it. It was parking cars. So okay. he had that car is a little bit long. I've talked to them about that. Mm -hmm. It can fit in the garage, but they have two cars. So I'm asking them if they would like to maybe swap out the shorter car because where he's parking it now, um, he's parking it in front. He doesn't pull it in. Right. So. Um, and I talked to Meredith about that, that as long as it actually is like a parking space if someone parks in front or in, as long as it is that is their parking spot. But I just want to make sure he understands that he cannot have a, cannot exceed the line, cannot be in the street at all. Right. When he pulls all the way up, his car isn't, so, but. Right, it's a, I mean, at least for our examination, we're not as, I mean, part of the problem is, is because it's, it looks as if it's a 15 foot deep drive be between the street and the, uh, and the garage. So it's, it's, but that's an existing spot. That's not a newly created spot. Right. I'm, I'm also hearing that you have a parking space inside the garage. Yeah. Correct. If and he wants to use it. It and, is an and open so that garage. Is, that is one of the parking. four parking spaces right. for 108. Correct. And do you know the depth of that? That's that's what's that shown on reason? here. The 15 by 10 is the spot that is in the garage. Okay. And so then it's right here. it's labeled outside of the garage. It's no, it's not. In the door. Oh, no, oh, oh, no, I that's see. inside the building. Everything okay. there on the hatch line, that's um, the edges of the building because gotcha. the building goes yep. all yep. the way to the property boundary. Okay. And then the picture you're Which seeing here like that I just passed around where there's a vehicle right in front of the garage, mm -hmm. technically they're parking in that little driveway Got to it. access the parking space. Okay. And that's all been existing. And right. was approved under a previous site plan. Right. All we've done is matched Labeled it up it. with the previous site plan by putting in the curbing and the grass, and it's all they're out of they're out of the actual yep. plowed right of way there. Right. That makes sense. Okay, but the the four spots for 108 State Street would be the three that that or access through the shared easement. The easement, yes. Right. And then the uh, fourth is the garage space. Right, right. The one we were just talking right. about. Right. And then the remaining parking for 106 are the four spaces indicated here. Mm -hmm. um, Correct. And just for clarification, it looks as if two of those spaces are almost back to back but can those be accessed independently they actually can yes okay so somebody somebody pulling into that that space in back the sort of using the lot lines i mean uh, the compass lines it would be sort of the northwest parking space um, they can do that whether there's somebody parked below at that the reason Lower is because there is room on the left, so okay. if you needed to turn. So we don't allow trucks or commercial vehicles. It has to be an automobile. Mm -hmm. So someone right. with a big Ford F-250 would be a problem, actually, in a lot of the spaces. that We, we specifically don't like people to have big trucks. Well, and uh, if someone did put a big, giant truck in there, that could be a problem. 
Well, and Dan, under the current regulations, yeah. in residential lots, you can have tandem parking spaces. Right. No, I just wanted to understand the nature of this particular parking space. Just gotcha. To un understand whether it was a tandem space or whether it was yes, it, an it independent. Is. Just just the way it's it's sort of, and it's not, it's the surveyor's lines that make it a little bit confusing. I just want to make sure, for clarification, what you're saying is, is that they, they can be accessed independently. It's just... Correct. If the bigger the car, the more difficult that would be. Exactly. And presumably the skill of the driver would play into it as well. Yes. Okay. Um, and is the plan to sell off 108 State Street or... Both? They are actually, they're listed. They're both listed. Um, people are interested in both, so they may not even want the line drawn. Someone, we just want to be able to offer an option if we decide to sell one or the other. Um, so that that's the reason that we wanted to draw the line, is to be able to sell one or the other. I'm just going to ask that you make sure the microphone is pointed at whoever's talking, just in case. So it, it, picks it up a little bit better. Okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, <coughs> so let's move on to the issue of landscaping. If you could give us an updated refresher on what your landscaping plan is. Unfortunately, I don't have copies. Oh. Do, do we have a... You, ha you, you have our plan, don't you, Meredith? Yeah, I'm going to okay. give you the extra. Oh, great. Thanks. What would I do without Meredith? <laughs> so this is what they've we got. We talked. Okay, yep, great. this is what they've got. Right. Yep. I just didn't know if they had copies. So the yard, we I got grass growing already. I'm trying to I've been fertilizing it and keep trying to get it strong so we can we've been mowing it so people can start using it. Um, so there is, if you're on the front on the far left in the in the front of the the yard on 108, there's a proposed tree, but that tree was also part of um, the other side plan, and I planted a little cherry tree there, and it just this. It just is sad. People have backed into it, and I've tried to save it. So, I mean, part of my propose, proposal is I'd like to put the original tree that was in there as a crab apple tree, and I want to get at least a 10-foot tree, something big enough that is substantial. That mm -hmm. I've already looked at them. They have some really nice ones at Agway, and so that's kind of the historic tree that was there. They're all over Montpelier. And if I put a 10-foot tree in, it's something that people won't um, not look out for people backing up in the winter so it'll be a tree and people will, will know it's right. there and then I just thought framing the yard with a lilac on either end just to kind of create a line a buffer to stop the the line of a road so that it looks like house behind so this is in the newly created in the newly yard, created yard, yard in the new yard <laughs> on either end like maybe I have a lilac growing at 106 like three feet from the road and it survived the plowing and the salts and it's there and it's thriving so if I put them three feet back and if I put them on the ends and I don't take up the yard for people to to use okay so that was my proposal um, to put those two lilacs in and then of course we could do flower boxes you know the barrels people could move those around and I think we're less concerned about that sort of seasonal planting mm. and much more about the landscaping buffer that's created. Um, one thing I'll ask, but I think I know the answer, is that most of your property behind the houses is, is wooded. Mm -hmm. Correct. Is that correct? That's, yes. It sort of goes down steep. And so it's it's just wild it's, right now. Yeah, growing profusely, yeah. Green. Okay. So, so really what you're proposing are you know, effectively two trees and 
two lilac bushes on 108, and then I see, I see at least, um, looks like three lilacs around 106 and two trees there. Mm -hmm. Is that, yeah. Are those planted already yes. or are those proposed? Those have been growing because they were part okay. of the original site plan. Um, They're healthy. So, so really, apart from the proposed two lilacs and the one proposed tree, to replace the rest the one is that was growing. There. Yeah. The rest yeah. is already sort of existing landscape. And yes. the lilac, fortunately, I planted that lilac that's existing. It's really beautiful and it's huge. It, it's right over the line, so it's creating. If you look at the um, 108, the back stairway, and there's parking there. And so what it does is it divides the parking. So there's a beautiful lilac growing there. And when they drew the line, I was hoping it would, I wouldn't have to move it. And it, it, the line went right next to it. So that lilac is existing and is creating a really nice buffer. So when you're in 108, it's creating a good screen. You don't see their cars. Um, and then the tree in the corner here will just also create linear you know, division. Like these are two separate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of a. Um, limited planting in the front yard, but a very wild backyard. Mm -hmm. That's a fair characterization yeah. of what you're proposing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we have any landscaping questions? That no, good summary. OK, good. Mm -hmm. All right, um, and then you know, just as a technical note, the staff has picked up that some of the uh, corner markers and angle points on the survey need to be added in the final version and that's something that Meredith has talked with Richard Bell about and he said it was an inadvertent omission so presumably oh, you need to put the marks on the just on the map oh on the map yeah because I noticed some surveyor posts have appeared right so the I went I've your new line <laughs> you know where your new line jogs yeah. that corner on the survey here it doesn't have it marked as having as having a post being put in um, mm -hmm. so that just on the final plat it needs to be marked that there's a survey post there, but I've already spoken to Richard Bell, and, Thank and so he's actually, aware. Actually, I it. saw things appearing in the driveway. Okay. <laughs> and we're like, "What is this sur surveyor's things?" So yeah. he's he's been back doing it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Okay. Any other issues that the board wishes to raise on this? Nope. Um, you know, Gary I'll, and Allison, I'll congratulate you. I think you really took um, what was came to us as a troubled application and. <laughs> um, really made some good decisions so you know well the pre-meeting was extremely helpful very helpful um, really happy with that yeah good mm -hmm. suggestions yeah good. well good uh, so I'll entertain a motion that, from the board mr. chair I would move final subdivision approval for 106 East State Street good. Uh, motion by Kate do I have a second second that motion second by Rob any further discussion I'd note that in doing so, we're not adding any additional landscaping requirements, which I'm perfectly comfortable with, but mm -hmm. just to be clear about that. Thank you. Okay. So no additional landscaping beyond what's presented on the site plan. Good. Correct. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your right hand. You have subdivision approval. Uh, that will be pending in a written decision that will issue, and of course you have the 30-day appeal period. Um, Pending at following that. So good luck. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so if you'll introduce yourself. Hi, Paul Markowitz. Okay. Resident of Montpelier, Old Pearl Street. I think you guys might know Deb. We, we've heard we've heard her name her. before. Yeah. Um, DRB alum. So if I can ask you to raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give for the matter under consideration shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Good. So this is a conditional use review. Um, my understanding is you're starting a bread making company yep. as a home occupation. And my understanding further from reading the staff report is that the primary issue is about traffic. Um, yes. And the amount of traffic. So why don't you give us sort of an overview of the proposed project, um, but knowing that we're particularly interested about traffic? Um, sure. So um, I recently left working full time, and I've been a bread baker for 40 years. My starter's 38 years old, and people love it. And so I've decided that 
it's almost a public service uh, to get my bread out there more. And so the um, plan is to use existing facilities, our, my own, the oven that we have in the house. I converted my office, which was already an office, I made it into a bakery. So there's no new, no, no new space that's needed. Um, the plan is to make 25 loaves a week. Um, I would bake it out of my house and I would sell it directly out of my house. Uh, the plan, and I think where the thing about the traffic is, is that I would sell it to 25 loaves and then people would come during a period, let's say three hours on a Thursday, and they would come by to pick up the bread. It would be a fairly quick transaction. They give, give me the money, I give them the bread and they're on their way. I think I've also indicated that if this goes really well, I'm, I would consider, I'm thinking about the idea of even going up to 50 lows, but you know, that would, that's very pot, you know, I put that on, it would be on a separate day that I would, because I have a limit in terms of how much I can bake in a day, so be right. on a separate day. So it could potentially be two days of up to 25 people per day picking. Now a lot of that traffic could be, you know, because we live in the meadows, so a lot of that traffic could be by foot, bicycle, et cetera, et cetera, not necessarily all by car. I don't know. What else would you like to know? Sure. Well, I mean, so you would be selling the loaves out of the sort of front of the house then? and people It's actually be the back of the house. Okay. You know, because that's where the bakery, I'm getting used to the idea of selling it, that's, that's where the bakery would be. Um, but like, and so some of this, you know, strikes me as very similar to like what Mangy's deals with, you know, how foot traffic as well as car traffic and how would you see people coming up? Would they be using your driveway, or would they be you be they'd telling be them to park on the street? They'd be encouraged to park on the street. You know, our driveways. You know, I guess we got two vehicles. It would be pretty full. Mm -hmm. um, I would have my own. Um, what are those signs called that stand up on their own? Or like a sandwich, sandwich board. Sandwich board. Sandwich board that I would take in and out. You know, just on the delivery day. Mm -hmm. uh, and on there, I could indicate. You know, please park on the street. But that would certainly be in the. So they, people would order by email. I would take their orders. As part of that, there would be instructions about picking up your bread, the directions, and that kind of thing. So it would be like, please park on the street. And Pearl Street's a pretty wide street, so it's, mm -hmm. you can park easily on both sides of the street, and cars can still move through. It's not a lot of traffic. And you're fairly close to, is that, is that winter, the cross yep. street? Yep, the one that goes up the hill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, would you would you have an objection if there was a condition that said you know customers would not be able to use the driveway? Um, for no, because I don't plan on having okay. them use the driveway anyhow. Yeah, so. Right. Yeah. yeah. So just to make that, I think more than just simply please try not to park in the driveway, more of a condition because I think one of the concerns, at least that I could foresee, would be people coming in. Stopping, picking up the bread, and then backing out into traffic. Yeah, so yeah. You know, which I, having to do that on my own driveway, I know. You know, the more times you do that, the more times you're risking somebody backing into somebody right. onto the street because um, mm -hmm. there is no ability to turn around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, definitely, it would reduce the risk by having not people not back out. Right. Mm -hmm. The other thing I remember there was a question in the uh, staff report, the red part of the. Mm -hmm was about truck traffic, et cetera. So um, we are talking small operation here. So <laughs> there aren't going to be truck deliveries, you know, anything more than like a UPS or something like that. You know, that's that's what we're talking about. Any right. supplies, I'm going to get like flour, I'm going to get like through the co-op or something like that for now. Okay. So, and yeah. when you say getting it through a co-op, would you then go pick it up or would you have it delivered? No, I'd pick it up. Okay. Yeah. So really a minimal amount of actual delivery trucks. We're not going to see like the Black River produce truck stopping in front of your... Yeah, when I get up to a thousand loaves a day, then we, you know, I can come back to the... Yeah. We should talk again. We, we can talk. Then we should talk. Yeah, we, we should, should talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I okay. answer seriously. No, I don't anticipate any of those vehicles coming up to the house. Mm -hmm. Okay. I did let all my neighbors know. I know they got letters. Actually, that raises a good question. Is anyone here uh, to provide comments for this particular application? All right. 
Well, I don't know if you've offered free bread to mollify them. Um, <laughs> well, there will be a, you know, neighborhood, you know, kind of bread opening party with free bread available. So that's down the road. Bread and bread and alcohol on either end of town. Um, <laughs> All right, any other questions on traffic or any other concerns? No, I agree with the, condi the condition that you mentioned to just solidify that parking will be on street rather than the driveway, which makes sense given the driveway and given your use of it. Well, and I, I think the other part of that is it also um, shortcuts, I think, some of the 3010 access and circulation issues mm -hmm. that would otherwise be applicable. Um, you know, we're really talking about keeping it on the street. Um, you know, this would be on street short term parking. You're really talking about pickup and delivery, not all that dissimilar from what most of the general public when they stop by Mangy's does as well, right. where you're not you're not starting a thrift store in in front where your baked goods will be perused. It would be yeah. true. That's what traditional baked stores are called. Yeah. Um, so You'll have to tell us more about that later, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if someone were to uh, ride their bike to pick up a loaf of bread, where would they put put the bike? I mean, is there a place up against the porch? Well, they could pull out right into the yard there. That would be all right. Yeah. 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 So it wouldn't be on the sidewalk. That's a good idea. Right. 25 bikes on the sidewalk. <laughs> no good. All right. Good. Um, and I'm just double checking, but I think that is the primary concern. Um, so we're talking about 25 per day, two days per week, this would be yeah, starting out one day. Yeah, right, but I, I think at least for our purposes here, you know, rather than making you come back when you make that incremental jump, right. it's better for us to sort of consider the outlier um, okay. uh, that you're wildly successful, that you can double production, um, and uh, that we're talking about 50, 50 car trips a week. Um, potentially of the customers coming for bread. And it, if, if that's the case, you know, the other analysis that we have to conduct is under conditional use and whether that would be an undue um, burden on the neighborhood, um, on a would have an undue adverse effect on traffic and whether it would have an undue adverse effect on the character of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I will note that Pearl Street isn't is is actually designed so it's not a cross cut through street with the uh, the little speed bumps that discourage people. Um, yet, 25 car trips per day does not seem to be excessive given the character of the neighborhood. That this is a wide street. This is not a a narrow little uh, alley. This is a fairly broad avenue. Um, it's also located in. Uh, close to an intersection of two cross streets so that, you know, it isn't, a, circulation shouldn't really be an issue. I don't think it will cause a traffic jam in the meadow, um, at least based on the testimony that's been given. Yeah. Um, and so. I, I think we could even question whether there would be an adverse impact, right. much less an undue adverse impact. And that's the standard. We have to make sure it's not an undue adverse impact. I think it's not undue. It may not even be adverse. So. That's my opinion, based on the information we've heard. And also based on uh, the feedback that the Public Works has given us, which is basically they, they, they don't have concerns about right. what's being proposed. I mean, uh, otherwise, this is really a sort of standard home occupation business, and it's really the traffic that's bringing it before us. Um, but I'm, I'm certainly satisfied with the, the testimony that it, it shows that it's a, a very light impact on the neighborhood. It's a limited scope of what you're proposing. Um, you know, certainly we hope you do run up against the problem of having a thousand loaves um, because good bread is worth its weight. Um, it's sourdough, I should make it's sourdough. Oh, I mentioned that. You mentioned the starter. There'll be a rye with caraway seeds and a whole wheat. All right. Eight-inch rounds, baked in Dutch ovens. Each one weighs three pounds, so it's a good, hearty, mm. healthy. <laughs> I mean, just a little PR here, you know. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, very. Yeah. <laughs> the overselling. 
very close to advertising at this yeah. point. Um, you know, and uh, there have been other home occupations in that in that neighborhood. I know Eat More Kale was located not too far away from that. Um, <coughs> although I don't know if he did too much retail out of his garage. Um, but this is similar to you know the way Mangy's works. Um, which does not seem to have an ad do, uh, undo or adverse uh, impact on the character and neighborhood. Any other questions on just this as application? This is a basis of comparison. Does anybody know what, uh, what Mangy's produces on a daily basis? More than 25. Yes. More than 25. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I mean, but they also have a distribution system yeah, on do. top of it. Yeah, and it, it's not exactly an apples to apples comparison. It definitely um, isn't, but I was more of my curiosity more of a rye to sourdough comparison. Um, <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, I think uh, I think this is, this is um, notwithstanding the fact that they do substantially more, I think this even more goes to the fact that this is not likely to take any type of cut into the character of the neighborhood um, or traffic. So, if there are no other questions, I will entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, I move conditional use approval for the home industry bread baking proposed for 4 Pearl Street. Okay, motion. With the condition that um, customers will park on the street in order to pick up their bread. Friendly amendment that it did you mention conditional use approval? I well? believe I did. Okay. Thank motion you. by Kate with a condition. Do I have a second? Second that motion. Second by Rob. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. You have your permit. Good luck with, uh, well. <laughs> Sorry. This is the way Phil used to do it as well. Um, I would be the, saying the same permit, thing to Phil. The permit is, will be forthcoming and issuing, and knowing, of course, that you have 30 days in which a window for an appeal may be taken, um, but the approval has, we've, we voted to approve it, and the uh, permit should be forthcoming. Should I keep the sign, the Z sign on my up? Uh, yes. Yeah, keep that one up, and you'll when you after your written decision comes out, you'll also get an actual permit, and you'll need to post that permit in your window at that time. Great. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. See, Good see luck. you at farmers market. Good luck. Where I'll be awesome. promoting. <laughs> Mr. Proctor, <laughs> your turn. My apologies. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Again. Glad to know about some new bread. <laughs> <laughs> a lot more detail than we anticipated. Um, so this is a sketch plan subdivision review, and I just, for everyone's benefit, because I believe we have, is this the only uh, sketch plan tonight? Yes, this okay. is the only sketch plan yeah. tonight. Uh, so sketch plan is not under oath. We take no evidence. We make no final decisions tonight. Okay. Tonight is really an opportunity for us to give you feedback um, for any neighbors or interested parties who may be in attendance to give you feedback or voice concerns that they may have uh, for you to have an opportunity to explain you know your application it's not uh, necessarily an opportunity to move it forward or defend it so much as just to explain and, and to hear these are the issues that we're seeing and that we're arising it's a very informal process and as mr shy indicated in the first application it can be a very helpful process for the applicant to see okay. yeah. well, these are the concerns and let's come up with either creative solutions to address it or you know uh, re-emphasize where in our application existing application these questions are, are answered and addressed okay so why don't you um, start out, Mr. Proctor, by giving us sort of an overview of what you're proposing? Um, uh, we're proposing, uh, our lot is uh, about 15,000 square feet and separating it into two properties, one with the house on it, which will be about 8,500 square feet, and the other property, which I believe was separate at one time years back, of about um, 7,000, 7,500 square feet. And um, uh, the, on the only thing that uh, has been mentioned to me by anybody is my, the neighbor on uh, 
on the other side of that lot. But there's a fence there between that property now that's in a little bit of disrepair. And she asked if we could fix that up and make it a better fence. And we said, sure, that's no problem. Uh, we don't have any um, plan to do anything immediately with the property. We're not developing it or anything like that. Uh, we wanted to be able at some point in the future to perhaps sell that separately uh, from the house. But obviously, uh, as part of the subdivision, the idea is that once you subdivide, it could be sold off mm -hmm. from there, and, and separate residence would be built mm -hmm. right. on it. Um, one thing I'll sort of note off the bat is that at least the uh, Richard Bell survey that we have mm -hmm. does not indicate where a driveway would be. Um, uh, it, no, it does not. We were thinking if someone wanted to do a driveway, the, uh, the best place to do it would be right next to the driveway for the other property. There's about um, maybe 18 feet there before it begins to slope a little, and we thought that would be a good place. It's not something we were planning on doing ourselves to the property, but if it... You don't have to necessarily um, do that. To build, you don't have to build a driveway, but we will need to see when you come back for final subdivision review, we would need to see where a driveway would be. In, in part, okay. um, you know, I do understand that Marvin slopes up. It starts to slope up at this point, right. um, and it may drop off in the front. And so showing that it's possible to put a driveway in a particular location is important. Um, in part, as well, you know, there are issues about where driveways can be located um, in relation to each other and, and oh, whether okay. or not the best way to even do this would be to do a shared driveway off of your existing driveway. Um, would that be like a, an easement or how would you? Correct. Uh, okay. It, you, you'd okay. have to, when you sold the property, grant an easement, a right of act, ingress and egress for the driveway to okay. the neighbors um, and have that sort of shared driveway. Or it may make sense to put it in another location, but the, the short of it is that we need to see at least where a driveway could potentially be located. Um, and when you say see that, do you need a sketch of it, or what do you need? Yeah, we need a sketch of it and show distances. Um, okay. And as you'll see in some of the subdivision regulations, you know, it does talk about access and circulation um, under what's, uh, I think it's section 3010. Um, Meredith can certainly point you to the to the right sections, but that okay. deals with, you know, how you access and circulate vehicles mm -hmm. in and out of the property, mm -hmm. um, in relation to the road, in relation to existing driveways, making sure that you know what you don't create, what, what we don't want at the end of this is a is a lot that can't have a driveway without some extraordinary effort, you know, would, would effectively be a landlocked parcel. Gotcha. Or uh, we don't want a, a parcel that can only have a driveway that would conflict with all the other driveways. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we need to see a driveway on the sketch. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, one has to be effectively located. If only, it, it may not be the one that ultimately gets built, but at least it would be the one that would show us for purposes of the subdivision that a driveway could be located. The possibility of it. Exactly. Yeah. Without what, is, what is the width that is necessary for that in the, in the uh, um, I believe it's, I'd, I'd have to, I'd, I'd actually defer to the, it's the B71 standard, which I think is 20. It's the actual width of the driveway is actually more of a Department of Public Works standard, and I can't I can't remember what the actual number is. I think it might be 20 feet, but that can there there can be some wiggle room on there. Um, but but we'll you know we can we can discuss we can discuss that after the sketch plan hearing for sure. I okay. can't remember the exact width of what the driveway needs to be. Yeah, just thinking off the top of my head, that would be the obvious place to put it. Yeah. But, it, you know, there is 60-foot frontage there, so depending mm -hmm. on what somebody wanted to do, yeah. uh, I don't think it would affect any other driveway whatsoever. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe I could add to the chair's comments and just Please say do. the reason we're asking some of these very specific questions about what goes where and the reason we have this list of standards that we're ticking through right. with you is to make sure that once this subdivision is complete, you have something that you can use um, as a landowner, and also we have something that works 
in the neighborhood and for the city. So, so that's what all these add up to, is okay. making sure it's yeah. a good, good decision instead of something weird. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think considering that, I think uh, what we would do, it, unless there's some other reason, is have somebody make a sketch of, of that area, because I think that works pretty well. Yeah. And then if someone wanted to change it, like you're saying, they could do yeah. Right, yeah. and just, just as, a, as a point, for example, right now the, the zoning bylaws talk about access points shall be spaced as specified in the, in the bylaws, which for this, this particular district require a minimum of 100 feet between curb cuts and intersections. So, you know, where you cut for a driveway has to be at least 100 feet back from an intersection mm -hmm. um, and 45 feet between driveways. So, you know, that's something you Our driveway is on the same side of the street? Uh, any driveway. Any driveway. Okay. Any driveway. So, in this instance, if you really wanted to try and have these driveways right next to each other, it would make more sense to really have it be a shared curb cut and have the easement. Gotcha. Right. And, th and that may mean expanding your existing driveway so it's a little bit wider. Um, and in fact, the bylaws do encourage that type of shared driveway. Oh, they do? Okay. They do. Yeah, I don't think that's any problem there because yeah. the width would be. Right. But yeah, it is, it is on both sides of the street um, that those measurements come from. In, in part because, of course, both sides of the street feed into the same. And uh, in a street like Marvin, it's not as, it's not as if there's two demarcated, delineated lanes, um, say like Main Street, right. that, that's a little bit wider. Um, so there's obviously some concern about how, how traffic comes in and out. Yeah. Right. And, with, and w within our standards, we do have a provision. It's not in the staff memo, but in the section that talks about spacing, it says the Development Review Board may reduce the spacing requirement if certain standards are met. And those may be hard to meet or may be easy to meet. They really, de they're case by case. Right. Um, so, the street, I'm sure. yeah, I would, I would sort of put that in the hopper as as part of your considerations, and Meredith can, can okay. talk with you about those. Right. Uh, those aren't a guarantee, they're just kind of a, a release valve for appropriate circumstances. Right, right. If, if there's no, if there's no impact, <coughs> then there's really no other, other viable option for, um, for a driveway, we can consider on a case-by-case -case basis. Gotcha. Yeah, Kate point out. Yeah, so if you, if the shared driveway option is, for some reason or another, whether it's engineering or something else, really doesn't seem viable, then you can come up with an alternative plan, I'll review it, and we can run it by Department of Public Works, too, to see what their thoughts are before it comes back here in the final application process. Okay. Sounds good. Good. Is there, um, is this two existing separate tax parcels? Because I, on the survey, it sort of gives two different parcel IDs, and I just... Right, and that's, that's, so... The, well, the survey, yeah, there, there were two parcel IDs because it was at one point two parcels, um, and but they have since been merged. So it's going back to what was existed right. originally. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Right. Doing that, do we have a determination or making that that, that does trigger this subdivision process? Yeah, that that's that's, that's it. We, that yeah, we. Okay. Yeah. Just didn't that's a good question because they are listed as having separate parcel numbers even sure. today. I just right. I just yep. read the survey and it, you know it's not. Yep, those those are the historical parcel numbers. Okay. Or historic parcel numbers. Okay. Um, I just read, read the notes of the survey and it appears that this is actually a retracement of the two existing lots, and that hmm. there's not a new line. So I just wanted to make sure that we've crossed our T's and dotted our I's to make mm -hmm. sure we're not requiring it. A subdivision of an existing subdivision. I'll I'll go back right. to Richard okay. to check on that with him. Yeah. Right. But my understanding is based on all of the other information we have here at the city level okay. that Ooh. this subdivision had to happen. Okay. Thank you. So, um, and the proposal would be that lot two that you're creating the second lot that you're creating would be a residential, would be sold for residential use to build? Uh, yes, for, to have the ability to, to do that. I don't know when that would happen. Right, but you're not subdividing it and planning on selling it as a commercial or retail? Oh, no, no, I mean, commercial. Um, one of 
uh, I would recommend you take a look at the staff report if you if you haven't. So we get a staff packet, and it often has in red. <clears throat> Is that the email I got from? Did yeah, I get the, it from the you? attachment. Yeah, I did take a look at it, and, and uh, just. Some of it is not anything that we don't think you can necessarily meet, but you do have to, it will have to be part of your final application. So, for example, the capacity of community facilities and utilities, the suitability of the land, you just need a narrative addressing and saying why your application either meets these standards or doesn't trigger, um, you know, doesn't violate these standards. Okay. Um, yeah. And, you know, I would say that overall, another residential structure or another lot on Marvin Street isn't likely to affect these community services or utilities you know it's close to the school so if somebody with a family moves in it's one family adding to the school population and it's not as if it would create new busing issues because they could clearly walk right, to the school so um, you know this is not talking that's served by city water um, and sewer is that I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Is, are the lots served by city water and sewer? Yes. Okay, yeah. so things like that, you know, we're not talking about creating additional requirements where you'd have to run new water lines out. Oh, no, no, nothing like that. Or, uh, I did notice something in there about the electric. Um, I don't know what would have to be done just to move electric to that lot. I mean, there's electric all along the street. I don't think it's too complicated. But well, that's I actually, could certainly check with the electric company if that's that's the next thing, you know, so we have this requirement that talks about running utilities under, uh, you know, underground as opposed to the traditional where you run it off the pole directly to the house. Okay. Um, and we've dealt with this in a number of subdivisions where it looks like the utility poles that serve this neighborhood are actually across the Marvin Street on the opposite side. Mm -hmm. um, and we've had testimony, and you're, I would certainly encourage you to, to confirm this with the power company where you know running a line under Marvin Street is not a feasible um, uh, proposal the Public Works doesn't like people digging up the street the public streets to run lines under and it's right. cost prohibitive um, so we do grant waivers for those type of issues okay um, but it would be helpful to understand that that is in fact the situation and there is no possibility to run those type of underground mm -hmm. lines um, because of the specifics of the situation. Um, right. And the water wouldn't be necessary to check with them, I assume? Well, I mean, the water is what it is. Exactly. I mean, that's that's really, I mean, there's no water that runs above the ground. Right, exactly, it's, so it's fine. It's, it's really, we're talking about telephone, cable, electric that run above. Um, and, and what it is is it's, you know, it's one thing if the power lines are on your side of the street to run them down off that line underground gotcha. um, but when they're across the street like this we've had several applications in which there's been testimony and we've, we've taken note of it just in a general sense that this this may be a cost prohibitive issue but I would certainly encourage you between now and your final application to confirm that okay is in fact the situation because what you will have to do is ask us to waive that provision okay um, so I'll check with the company and see yeah. what's involved um, but know that that we've we've dealt with that issue before, and that that type of waiver has been has been granted in these type of situations. Uh, Mr. Chair, if yes. I, um, I, I know that we may have some comments from from the audience on this. Could you remind me? Do we take those as we go, or do those all after we've walked through the staff report? What's your preference? I would prefer that we actually do those after the board okay. has had an opportunity to go through. So if okay. people do have uh, some comments or some considerations. Um, that we sort of save them till the end because they may I think in, in one case at least with the driveway it seemed as if that may have been answered by us as we were going along um, so we hopefully we will address the majority of the questions and okay. won't, won't have redundancy okay great just wanted to set expectations for that so folks knew where we we're headed thanks so, so I knew where we we're headed good um, so the next issue I think is is uh, <coughs> landscaping and the proposal does not have landscaping. I, I would encourage you to think about landscaping in part because both for yourself as well as neighbors, if you do put a house in there, um, how it fits and sits in there, um, you know, can have an impact on how other houses in the neighborhood, what their, essentially the view shed is. And, uh -huh. 
So, you know, landscaping in this sense is not the flower boxes or the whiskey barrels. They're the permanent plantings that provide some buffer between these houses mm -hmm. so that it's not house upon house or, you know, you're staring at your neighbor's living room window kind of thing. Um, so some consideration or at least some thought about a landscaping plan. Um, in part, what's helpful is to understand what exists there now, okay. what's likely to have to be removed if you build a house, um, and what a project would be involving for landscaping when a house would be built. Um, that way we understand um, and can approve that with those, with those conditions for, for landscaping, not requiring you to put in the landscaping before anything is built, but at least having that plan in place. And I think that often goes to how the neighbors feel about a subdivision because that's the impact that they're likely to feel on a day-to-day -day basis is what they're going to see. So right. understanding that there's a landscape plan in place as part of the subdivision is, is helpful and understanding what's there and what's gonna go um, and what would have to be likely added is, is helpful. Okay. Good. As I said, uh, I discussed it with Susan on the other side, and what she would like is just to have a fence there. So I don't right. think there'd be any landscaping on that side. Um, well, I mean, you know, the, maybe the fence would have to go if the house was, was put in, um, and if that was the case, what that would look like, or, you know, whether that fence would be repaired or, right, I gotcha. you know, uh, I mean, those kind of things are important. Um, you know, obviously, if you want to fix the fence, you can fix the fence. Uh, I hear what you're you saying. don't need a permit yeah. from us right. to do right. that. Um, you know, and you can make that commitment outside of the permit. You know, okay. that's something that the neighbor says, look, you know, I really want to do And so what you're saying, that. if I'm understanding about the landscaping, is just some idea of what might, what might be good. But since we're not developing the property in any way, it would be up to the people who, if right. someone eventually wanted to put a house up there, as long as it met the requirements, that, that you would, have for landscaping that, that would be par part of it and you know if you look you know if you look at the pictures here it, it seems like there's a lot of lawn in the front mm -hmm. and there's not mm -hmm. a lot of trees in back and so you know this house that's directly sort of below the new lot mm -hmm. any house that goes in there is going to have an impact on that right um and i don't know how houses are situated across the street or whatnot um okay. but but those you know, understanding that, you know, there would have to be plant, there might have to be plantings depending on where the house is located towards mm -hmm. this front here um, or along the front, you know, would be help, would be helpful for us in reviewing this and evaluating it okay. as well as, you know, understanding what the impact is likely to, to be or not be, um, you know, knowing that this is, this is, you're not talking about removing trees necessarily mm -hmm. to do this, but, um, you know what what it's going to need when it's built gotcha yep okay and of course that would depend on the location of the house on the lot and what they do exactly mm -hmm. obviously right so we wouldn't need a specific like i'm going to plant six trees here right seven bushes here but just an indication of these these are would be areas where there would need to be trees because there aren't existing trees here mm -hmm. um and there would be a house no matter where the house is located you know it might have an impact along the front um that would need to be mm -hmm. softened by the landscaping the buffering Mm -hmm. If I remember correctly, sometimes when we've done a subdivision like this, for example, the one on Pearl Street in the meadow, there was a condition saying that once the building permit for this structure on the subdivided lot was submitted, that would need to fulfill the landscaping requirements. So it wouldn't, do I remember that correctly? Yes. That it wasn't yes. even necessarily dots on the subdivision plan. Mm -hmm. It was a condition or a promise some basic thinking about what might go in when the house was being built. And making okay. sure so there's flexibility. And making sure that the final application has a site plan that shows what the current landscaping is on it. That's right, And yes. then we have a discussion at the final hearing as to some possibilities for future. Right. Okay. Good. Um, so those are my major points. I don't know if anyone else has any other concerns that they wish to add. If there are any neighbors or interested parties that wish to comment, um, I'd ask that you go to a microphone, that you'd state your name, 
Um, and feel free to make your comments. Um, I'm Michelle Braun. I live at 21 Marvin Street, which is directly across the street. Um, and just in the staff report, there was something about stormwater and the requirement to care, convey the stormwater over to Liberty Street, which I think would, was going to require easements across properties on Liberty Street. Hmm. Would acquiring those easements be a condition of the subdivision approval, hmm. or would that come as part of a development permit? That's a good question. Well, so I think at least as far as those are concerned in in part that's something that we need to determine at the final hearing um, whether or not and part of that is the drainage of, of how the lot you know the stormwater I, I think part of the reason why the stormwater has to go to Liberty Street is because of the hill it yes. can't come up to Marvin yes. um, and so part of the question I, is I get that I just wanted to understand how it fits in the process yeah um, no, I, I, you know, I mean, I think that's something that we would ultimately, we'd, we'd make that decision at the final application. Yeah, I mean, it's, there's different ways you can do it. You can require that the easement be recorded as part of the subdivision, um, and that's something that, say, with something as complex as the parking garage, it was required that all those easements be part of the final approvals. Right. Um, it isn't necessarily something that, has to happen with a smaller subdivision. Sometimes the board, and Dan might correct me on this, but sometimes with smaller projects, what is required is that before, as part of the zoning permit package, those easements have to be part of that approval process and have to be recorded for the zoning permit. And, and, and sometimes what that, what determines that is not, is both the, the size of the, the development and likely disturbed soils. Mm -hmm. Um, which we may not be able to determine at this point in time. So, you know, we may put it, as, it, it at the very least, we would put it in as a condition that they would have to seek it at a later time if they wouldn't seek it now. Um, and part of that is the applicant, because he doesn't have a project, may not know, you know, what the, what the stormwater needs of this particular piece of property are because there's no project plan. Right. And, the, and the stormwater needs of a, 4,000 square foot house as opposed to a 1,500 square foot house or can be very different. Right. Um, so that, that would be one thing that we would take into consideration. I mean, okay. certainly if there's testimony about stormwater and concerns, we would take that very seriously. And, um, you know, we often let the Department of Public Works um, guide us to a certain extent and utilize their technical um, resources and, and uh, experience in these issues. Okay. But it sounds like that's more part of the development process than the subdivision process. Right. Yeah, I mean it I mean it's it's one of these things and this is this is kind of similar to what the landscaping is, which is, you know, ultimately we're not going to make him plant trees right now because the project it doesn't necessarily the subdivision itself doesn't require it, but we still want to see something and understand so that when it comes before us again for an actual project, you know, that foundation has been laid. And so I think it's very similar with the stormwater. It's, there are some projects that just, it's, it's crystal clear they're gonna need stormwater. And we need to get those things in, lined up now and there's no, no reason to wait. Um, and other situations where it's gonna really depend. This, you may have also seen in the staff memo noted that um, the topography on page nine, the topography may create some additional steps for future development, such as obtaining easements from the property owner to the north for access to city sewer and stormwater. So it's yeah. not just, it's not just, I mean, stormwater, I guess, captures the, the right. um, that part, but the sewer would it's have to also go the to sewer. Liberty too, unless they do a pump. Right, yeah. right. So but it seems like that. people in the neighborhood have a pump, so. Yeah. So it seems like something we'll probably discuss in more detail at the final stage because mm -hmm. it does seem pretty essential to be able to have sewer and water on the lot if you want to. Yeah, put yeah it on it. the sewer mm -hmm. on the on the house now does go to Liberty Street. It does. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, so the question is, kind of tie into that and what that would look like, mm -hmm. um, and that what that's proposing. And again, you know, part of this is we understand you're not building an actual right. house or question, or you know, a project, but we need to see on paper that it theoretically could work for a project, you know. And, and oftentimes, 
there's six different ways to build a house on a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes, we, given the topography and other issues with the lot, there's only one way to do it. And so, there, but there has to be at least that one way. Otherwise, it can't be a separate standalone lot. Right. Yeah. So. And like you're saying, if it's a thousand square foot house, there's a lot of differences. If it's four thousand, I mean, I don't even know how big a house could even be built on a lot like that. Right. What are the regulations for the size of that? Are there any set? Well, I mean, you do have indic, and that was actually one of the things that I looked at. It does appear that uh, at least your surveyor has put in sort of a, a building envelope. Um, here, at least for purposes of setbacks. Uh -huh. um, so a house could be located within that. I mean, there are coverage calculations that we do, we do depending okay. on a sp specific district. You can only build so much uh, impervious soil on, on, a, on a lot. Uh, and there's also a 2,500 square foot maximum footprint in this district. So there's, oh, the, there's a, the footprint, yeah. yeah the footprint. That's there's enormous, yeah. I mean, because you go two stories on the footprint. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's 5,000 square foot house. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um. Was there anything else, Michelle? Okay. Any other uh, interested parties or neighbors that wish to talk about this application? Uh, okay. You come up, but then I also have written letter from another neighbor who couldn't make it today. Okay. Let's do that last. Yes, yes, please. please. Uh, I'm Rick Monk. I'm at 47 Liberty, which is kind of a corner abutting property. Um, sorry, I was taking notes as I, as I went, so we're going to maybe step back a little bit. Um, uh, Dan, you mentioned uh, that you were discussing the intent to possibly subdivide and sell the property for residential purposes. Um, and so my question is, could a subdivided parcel be used for commercial or other purposes? what is involved in that decision making well that's, that's it's yeah I mean it's part of it's the character of the neighbor the the classification of the neighborhood the permitted uses um, you know obviously he's not bound to only develop it as a residential if it's a permitted other type of use however um, you know we we like to understand what the applicants intentions are um, you know sometimes people do have it they have a plan they want to put in a business next door or okay. something um, but you know it's ultimately driven by what's allowable within this particular zoning district um, and there's a table of permitted and and conditional uses within the zoning bylaws but in addition, there's language within each neighborhood. So this is, you know, this is a residential 6,000. Um, and what is the base district? I mean, the uh, neighborhood. This is the. Sorry. We have about 50 different neighborhoods. And each have a sort of uh, succinct narrative. Yeah, College Hill, North. So, you know, if you read the character of the neighborhood, uh, I would suspect you would find that it's largely residential. And so any applicant who would come in who'd say, aside from a permitted use, you know, would have to s explain why this is, fits in with the character of the neighborhood. Yeah. So maybe just on its face, it's obvious that if you were to subdivide it, it would make sense to, to drop another house in there. But the, sure. raising the question of a commercial use, when you look anything around there, it just sort of set my bells off that yeah. that was a, 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 a possibility. Well, well as residential 6,000, mm -hmm. the options for any kind of commercial use are very, very limited. Yeah. Even so, even things yeah, that are conditional uses. Is, <laughs> well, there, there's a home in there, there's the home, the home business, yeah. which is a whole separate thing. Okay. Those can go in any zoning district. Um, but when you're actually talking about a full-on commercial use. There's almost there's very very few that could actually be here. Yeah, so I I can give you a couple examples from this great big table that you too can peruse at home. Um, in the residential cis district, one through four dwelling units are permitted. They can go to Meredith and get a permit and do it. But if someone wants to do five or more units, that's conditional. We have to maybe it comes to this board and we contemplate how well it fits in to the area. The same would be true of senior housing or um, a bed and breakfast. Those would all be conditional uses. None of the commercial uses we have listed, like neighborhood market, car wash, fueling station, retail, 
um, veterinary and animal services offices, none of those are allowed in this district. Though a religious facility would be, or a recreational park, or an academic uh, grade school. So, um, so there's a, a narrow range of what would be allowed given the character of the area and the, what we expect to happen in a place like that. Okay. That's a good question, though. Um, uh, I don't know particularly the question about the stormwater runoff. I would say that um, as you're developing your plans, as you're thinking about this, and as you guys are thinking about this, pay particular attention to, um, I, um, I know that 40, I think it's 45 Liberty, um, there's something of a, a, a new wetlands there. It, it has a lot of water that runs off. It's, um, and I know there's a problem currently with the stormwater um, drain that's been installed there. There's mm -hmm. been some, uh, I don't know, some, um, what do you call it, subsidence or something in the ground. It's fallen down. Anyway. So is, that, is, is, that, is that a city installed stormwater? Uh, it's Public Works. Okay. Um, and they've been out, I don't know the details on it, I've seen them out taking a look at it, but it's one of these uh, places that, you know, that when come, come springtime, it's, mm -hmm. it's wet constantly to the point where you can't walk back there. And it's on the down, it, you know, it's on the downslope of, of your property at that. So mm -hmm. I assume that there's some surface water. I don't know that that is the problem, and there's so much water down there. Um, but pay particular attention mm -hmm. to that as you're as okay. you guys are thinking about this. Um, and I just had a question about um, the, the impact to the subdivision and the current development rights on the property versus post subdivision development rights in the sense that, you know, what is your buy right, you know, ability to develop, to, you know, if you didn't subdivide the property, could you put a four, you know, unit dwelling on mm -hmm. there? Does that change after you subdivide it, or it, it it does? I mean, subdivision. The primary purpose of subdivision is it becomes a separate lot that can be sold to a separate owner. Yeah. Whereas if it's not, then the lots have to be sold together. They have to be single owner. Sure. Um, but as far as what could actually be built on there, it's true. He could he the owner could take his whole area and build a, a bigger building and tear down the existing. Mm -hmm house there um, there are accessory buildings and dwellings so he could build a second house there I mean there you know it's it's our bylaws contemplate allowable uses within that you know you couldn't put up two separate big houses um, you know uh, on there at some point the accessory has to be smaller and it's defined within our zoning bylaws um, but that's not to say that somebody couldn't build a new building and tear down the old one. Um, so it's, it's essentially whatever they're permitted to do, um, but they couldn't sell it separately. It, it but couldn't have its own life. Typically, you can only have one primary use on each parcel, each single right. parcel. So that's where uh, accessory use would be subordinate yeah. by definition to the, the primary one. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, so the final, the final thing we have here is a letter from Martha Smirsky, who lives at 15 Marvin Street, um, and her primary concerns are um, potential erosion from development of Lot Two, um, and the the fact that you know, disturbing soils. There's some issues with prior disturbance in the area, and then the driveway. And I don't think you got a copy of this, did you? I don't think so. Okay, I, I didn't see it if I did. I also I just returned from vacation today, so I only no, saw, I saw this in today. No, I saw in your email <laughs> you were going on vacation. So. So just a reminder to everybody, because um, I'm not sure Dan made this 100% clear that this is the sketch plan. So the comments that you've made today aren't technically on the record. If these same concerns are still an issue when the final application comes in, you'll need to resubmit your concerns and your, your okay. issues for all of the neighbors. 
and that's really directed at the neighbors. Obviously, you as the applicant, Mr. Pett, will, um, uh, Proctor, will we'll come back because you have to. Um, <laughs> but it, we want to make sure that the neighbors understand that as helpful as these comments are, and they are extremely helpful, um, they aren't, they haven't been added to the record as testimony. Okay. Um, so, you know, I would, given, uh, given the comments um, that we've, we've just heard as well as uh, Ms. Smirsky's uh, comments, one thing that I would recommend uh, that you consider, and I would suspect Public Works may have some thoughts on this, um, is that it may help, I know you've engaged a surveyor, mm -hmm. but it may help to engage an engineer to deal with some of these stormwater issues. This is clearly, you have three neighbors who've raised the issue of stormwater and concerns about it, and there's been testimony, not testimony, but at least some comments to the effect of, it's really wet down there, um, we're really concerned about it. You, you, I would recommend that you consider um, talking to an engineer to see if they have any uh, thoughts that may be helpful in addressing those issues. Okay. Um, because now would the uh, Public Works be somebody I would talk to about this? You would talk to them. They would give you some feedback, but they're mm -hmm. not going to design your project necessarily. Right. Right. Um, and so, you know, in you may want to talk with Public Works first, um, mm -hmm. and if they raise some of the same issues, that would that that would. If that was the case, I would highly recommend that you engage an engineer. And there are a number of really good ones around who do, you know, you're not talking about a full-on engineering stu study, but someone who can help you deal with these stormwater and drainage issues that are clearly uh, around the property. Whether they're caused or likely to be added to your property, that's where an engineer can help and clarify and provide testimony to say, no, you can build a a 4,000 square foot house and it won't change any of the drainage. Mm -hmm. This this comes from another issue or another area. You know, I mean, engineers are good at that, at saying this is our problem, this is not our problem. Okay. Um, and that may be something that you may want to consider, especially if Public Works raises red flags about some of these issues as and well. And if Public Works didn't feel there's any problem with the drainage, that would, it would not be necessary well, to get there? Well, you know, or? that's a judgment call on your part. and. Mm -hmm. What I would say is that you've heard now from three neighbors who have mm -hmm. raised these concerns, and the question you have to ask yourself when you come back before us is, are my answers sufficient that the board is likely to accept what has been given to them, or are these concerns nebulous enough that the board is going to have continued concerns? You know, we're, at the end of the day, we, we simply want answers that um, carry a certain degree of certainty. You know, we give a certain amount of deference to expert um, understanding the Department of Public, Public Works particularly. Um, you know, we rely on them, but at the same time, we want, we want to be able to answer these questions for ourselves, for our own satisfaction. And that's, that's ultimately your burden, is to persuade us that these issues are satisfactorily dealt with, and that mm -hmm. if this lot is created, we don't create problems because as a board what we don't want to do is create a separate parcel that all of a sudden causes the entire washout of middle liberty street um, right. or something I mean, else. I and nor do you i mean you know it does um you know so what we want to do is we want to make sure that what we're doing is compliant with the with the zoning bylaws and that there's some reliability to what we're making a decision upon Gotcha. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, no, I mean, it does make sense, yeah. And Meredith can certainly guide you and, and give you a certain amount of mm -hmm. feedback um, and give you, she's certainly dealt with public works. She'll be a bit more blunt than I will as to uh -huh. whether or not, you know, these issues are real um, right. and concerns are uh, serious or substantial. Mm -hmm. Just to clarify one thing you just said. Um, does the entrance of a, does the submission of a letter like this one at the sketch plan stage entitle someone to party status, or does anyone no. who's commented need to come to the final sketch plan? They, or they final need to come to the final, review? they need to come to the final, it's a okay. completely separate application. Okay, even though they've submitted in writing, yes. people right. need to come back. Okay, Correct. I want to get that on the record for anyone who's watching or listening at home, <laughs> or who will review the videos. Good. Thank you. Anything so when else? will the final application be? When, um, 
When do I have to do these things, Ben? Uh, within the next year. You have a year to submit your final application. Oh, okay. A year from so today. So as soon as I can do it, in, exactly. in other words. Yep. Yeah. So I would I would suggest that um, you know wait till I've got the minutes of this meeting put together. I'll send them a copy of those minutes to you. Okay. Um, and then if you want, you and I can set a meeting and discuss the game plan and what you need to add in and, and who we need to talk to. Or okay, you great. Can go ahead, but either way, you and I should meet before you submit your final application to the office. Okay. okay. Sounds good. Yeah. So, so uh, really, it's something that I could probably do if, if we talk mm -hmm. at the next meeting, if, as long as I have the sketch and uh, the engineer's report. With, with the deadlines, it'll probably be two meetings from now at oh, the okay. earliest. Okay. Yeah, it has to be submitted in time to give us adequate notice and warning and to give the neighbors adequate notice and warning in the public as well. Yeah. Okay. So. Good. Very good. Well, good Thank luck. You. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you all for participating. Next application is 29 Franklin Street. I can keep these. Yes. 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 Sorry, I did not put some documents. Oh, we'll share. Got three. And if you'll introduce yourselves for the record. I'm Ward Joyce, Montpelier Architect. Andrew Perzlik, I'm the owner with my wife, Mary Ann Donahue Perzlik of the house. Great. If you raise your right hand, I'll put you both under oath. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give for the matter under consideration shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Yes. Right. Uh, and is there anyone here that w wishes to provide comment on this particular application. If you are, just raise your hand. Good. Okay. Ward, if you want to yes. set the scene. We were here to ask for two, are they variances for lot coverage? One is a, a additional waivers. lot. Waivers. waivers. One is for additional lot coverage to put some stone in the backyard, and the other was to increase the or to increase the the um, already violating front yard setback and I did some research today actually that is what the new sheets I gave you is is that steps actually constitute construction and they are part of this part of the built building and so actually we are proposing the, the front steps of the house are already out at a given point relative to the front yard setback and actually what we're proposing is to just increase the depth of the deck alongside the steps and bring them out to, not even bring them out to the front of the steps, but actually have the roof overhang come as far as the existing front steps. And it does a couple important things. It gets the front steps covered by a roof for safety. And it also makes a four foot deep deck, a six foot deep deck, which makes it useful. But I think, <coughs> The most important point I, that I would like to make is that we actually are not increasing the frontage or we're not getting any closer to the front yard setback than the existing steps already do. Okay. Want me to let that one sit or would you like me to cover the other one at this, at this point too? No, okay, so, so essentially <coughs> you're asking for a waiver for the front yard setback to bring the porch forward. Even I actually with the steps. do. I actually don't. What I'm proposing is that the front porch can come as far forward as the steps, which is what the drawing shows. Right. And we are not increasing the use of the front yard at all. We are not decreasing the front yard setback because the porch, it's steps and porch, and we're saying we're going to bring the porch up to the plane of the steps, which is adding two more feet, and it doesn't extend beyond the existing. Right, but essentially what you're asking us is for, for a waiver for that. I mean, well, yes. I understand the argument that, okay. that, that, that you're, not, you're not bringing the porch out any further than its furthest yes. point of encroachment is. Yes. You're just evening it up yes. to its greatest, slightly back from its greatest point of encroachment. Yes, sir. And if um, that is a waiver, that is what we're requesting. <laughs> okay. Um, so the problem is that entry stairs 
are allowed all the way to the property line. That yeah. is not the same thing for a covered porch. Right. A covered porch is considered part of the building. <clears throat> okay. Um, you know, there's a there's a separate waiver for side and for like side and rear setbacks for decks and things that are not covered. Covered porches are a whole other ball okay. game when it comes to setbacks. So then I will retract that particular <laughs> argument. <laughs> Sorry, and trust uh, me, I would have made that argument no, for you if I could in the, in the it's staff report. It's quite all right. So then I ask you to look at the second page, <laughs> on which I have done a tour of the neighboring houses. And what I have found is that, or what we, I think, know for people that know this neighborhood is it is one of, it's a neighborhood with some of the tightest buildings to the street. And as you can see there, there's, I think, six different buildings directly around it that have front yard violations that exceed the ones that we're requesting, including the neighbor right next door, um, whose front porch is about five feet from the sidewalk, otherwise known as two feet from the front yard setback. And we are a good, or Andrew's house is a good, I mean, it's right, it's 11, I don't have the sheet in front of me because I gave all three of you away, but it's, essentially there are six houses directly around there that violate the front yard set by more than we are requesting. And we are requesting simply to add two feet to the porch so that it's six feet deep and usable, and therefore a friendly amenity in the neighborhood. Where it's, it's barely usable at four feet. And in the process of pulling it out, we can get the steps covered, which would be uh, add a heck of a lot of safety for the residents. OK. Um, and then if I'm understanding the other portion that you're looking for, which is the backyard coverage. Right. Um, so the lot is extremely, extremely small within city standards. And the idea out the back door was we're going to add a back door to the kitchen. And within uh, um, the allowed setback of the backyard, which is five feet, we were just looking to put stone down right outside the back door and a path leading to a gate in the fence. So it's a really small bit of hardscape. It's not a built deck above the ground. It's literally a stone patio on the ground. And because we have already an incredibly over I mean that the lot is already so small around the house that doing anything is a, is a variance or a, a waiver request. You know, literally even to put a stair out of the door would be a, a request for that. Mm -hmm. So it's a very small deck that we're hoping that um, you can see the way to allow us to do. Okay. So. I think it's helpful to jump into um, some of the waiver requirements. Just page on, four. Yeah, on on page four. It's actually right there. Um, <laughs> so it says uh, to grant a waiver, the board must find that. Um, but this isn't the beginning of the, the waiver. This is just a quotation, right? Sorry. So the nice thing is, is that the waiver provisions that we have now are much more friendly than the variance provisions that we used to have. You mean these two things? I've yeah. quoted the two things okay. that you have to grant. The two checks are items that are okay. checked. Okay, so the waiver, if authorized, shall not alter the essential character of the neighborhood or district in which a property is located substantially or permanently impair the lawful use or development of adjacent properties, reduce access to renewable energy resources, or be determined detrimental to the public welfare, and the proposed land development is beneficial or necessary for the continued reasonable use of the property. So these are the standards. So let's break these down, I think, one at a time is the best way to approach them. The first one talks about uh, altering the essential character of the neighborhood. And if I understand, Ward, your sort of informal survey of the neighborhood is that this is precisely what this neighborhood is about, at least for the front porch portion. And, and let me maybe take a further step of saying, let's look at the front porch waiver, uh, and then we'll go to the back 
area, which is that um, this is a neighborhood of front porches that are right up against the street, practically. Um, and that by doing so, you're, you're not altering the character, the essential character of the neighborhood. In fact, it's consistent with the essential character of the neighborhood. Does anybody have any questions? Um, okay, would it permanently impair the lawful use or development of the adjacent property? This is just strictly in your front yard. This is not blocking any sidewalk, any driveways, any cross streets. Solar access, nothing. Okay. <clears throat> well, then we get reduced access to renewable energy resources. This is not going to prevent somebody from putting up a solar panel or a wind turbine. Um, on the north side. On the north side. Um, and will it be detrimental to the public welfare? And I think the testimony here is that, again, it's fully within your property boundaries. It's, it's not, it's actually, whether or not the stairs themselves are part of the building, and I, I tend to agree with Meredith's analysis in part because that is what the bylaws say, but also I think it's steps are different, and we've differentiated them in the past. Um, I think it, 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 at least your testimony is that it's, it's, it's certainly not going to hurt anyone in the public uh, right of way uh, or affect them. So I think we've hit that point. And then the last point is that the proposed land development is beneficial and necessary for continued reasonable use of property. And while I understand um, a six foot porch is better than a four foot porch. Could you elucidate or elaborate on why um, and what the particular need for this expansion is? Well, the, I think the more important point of the two that I made was that the front steps can be covered by the roof mm -hmm. and the, the snow does shed forward onto the steps. So the ability to carry the roof out a little further is going to make it safer for the inhabitants. Um, and then a more fuzzy argument would be that a uh, porch less than six, six feet is not practically going to get used. That comes from the pr principles of Christopher Alexander that says that no deck should be s narrower than six feet or it won't get used. So I think that if it's big enough to actually sit comfortably on it, you're going to create a uh, better civic character in the neighborhood. I think it's actually an improvement for the neighborhood. But I think more importantly, the safety of the covered steps is, the, is, the, is why this is beneficial for the residents because I'm in the mood. So when you say Christopher Alexander, I presume he's an architect. I'm sorry. It's, yes. It's a, yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's, a, yeah, I just think as anything narrower than, than six feet of a deck ends up not getting used by people. Because if you sit and put your feet out, you use about three of them. Mm -hmm. And if you have to kind of barely edge around someone, you don't find that three or four people sit there comfortably. It actually becomes unused. So by making it at least six feet, it creates a social space. It creates a usable, social. useful, semi-public space on the front of the house. Okay. It's yeah, what front porches are for. Yep, it improves walkability and human scale and character, all that. Yep, it's a better it's, porch. It's okay if one person, if I'm sitting out there by myself, I feel kind of okay. But if my daughter or my wife also wants to sit out with there, like the board said, you can't get around the other people mm -hmm. if you want to have a little table out there. Yeah, sure. It's not as useful. If you want to run a front porch campaign for your next re-election, right. you know, it's Well, and your dog needs space to wiggle. That's right. You know, having a, <laughs> having a usable front porch, you know, is an improvement to the neighborhood. It's sure. Beneficial. Yeah. It's I mean, beneficial. I think, yeah. I, I, and again, I, I think it's fairly close to self-evident. Nevertheless, it's nice to have the record reflect that. So does anybody have any further questions about that waiver issue? So let's talk about the... Oh, we're, we're, we're done with the setback. Moving on to the the, um, the, the 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 lot coverage. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Um, I mean, I I think the discussion is reasonable about the you know setback waiver. It just seems in the regs and the stop board the, the numbers are pretty straightforward when we bail on a grant that you know ten percent, mm -hmm. um, which I, you know I think we've made the argument maybe to uh, uh, exceed that. Um, I just, uh, I think that, you know, going forward here, I'm not seeing any sort of definitive determination of where that street line actually is. Um, and I think out of fairness to any other applicant on the street, we might want to solidify that to get some consistency. Um, 
I see one I guess document that is this one there. Mm -hmm. It's like a piece of a survey. Yep, I've got that. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, I guess that based on the material submitted, you know, it seems like you have use this to come to your determination where things are. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, when I pulled this in the city, they said this is unique, that you actually have all the dimensions of your lot, that this, this is very useful for you because it does tell you exactly how big your lot is. Uh, I'm just seeing the front line is showing the survey uh, not really being exactly parallel with the street. Uh, and uh, I sort of raised the question as to whether that point you've indicated on there is actually representative of the of the right of way, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, don't, I just don't want to go down a rabbit hole here, but I, I think my sort of uh, maybe guidance for setback waivers is that you know either the city or you know the neighboring property owner, in other cases from the side of the rear, um, mm -hmm. sort of grants some permission um, to do so, I and mean, I think that that's made fine without coming to determination, but um, without that. Um, I think that you're going to have to, you know, if we're going to grant a waiver, we should know exactly, you know, the number that we're granting the variance to. Mm -hmm. um, it's very easy to, you know, someone to come in three houses down and someone to come to a different determination of the right of way, and that, you know, it may be supposed to be a straight line to be up the entire street, mm -hmm. and uh, we find it not. I, I did get the right of way set back from the center of the road from the city engineer. It's not on here, but it is. Um, the one that's shown on the plan I submitted to d tonight is from the city engineer's um, office. That it was X number of feet from the house, and that was that was gotten from their plans. Okay. Yeah, that and because I mean they did have three. They found three of the pins out of the four, and then yeah, I, I don't know. The point that I'm trying to make, and maybe a letter from, from the city or from uh, Thomas Carl, you know, just verifying that. Uh, that marker in front of the street is actually marking the right of way because it's not necessarily the case. Um, so you're talking about what can sometimes be the difference between the edge of the property and the edge of the right of way. Sometimes the right of way goes a little way into the property, sometimes it doesn't. Is that, is that what, you what you're mean? talking about? Well, that's, I think it may be a more layman's way of <laughs> but I, I, explaining it. To yeah. be honest, I mean, it is shown on the plan. I have shown the front yard setback well into the yard because I was being honest about the discovery I made. Mm -hmm. So the plan that I've got that shows it well into the yard is actually representative as opposed to me saying somehow that the sidewalk or the road was the lot, which wouldn't have been, which wouldn't have been what I found. I guess maybe it's just the opinion of one member of the board, but I would like a either confirmation from public works of a specific point in terms of measurement off the building or a determination from a, a you know a surveyor as actually where the line is and what fixed number we are approving as a, as a mm -hmm. waiver, waiver. But that's just the opinion of one member. Okay. Um, Good point to raise. Was there any other concern about that? I, I agree in general that when we put a number down on paper and say that we're granting a a waiver of X number of feet and inches, we want to make sure that we're being precise. Um, this is something that I don't have as much experience in as, as you do as a surveyor, but um, I, I appreciate you raising the, the question. I do want to make sure we get it right. Although at the same time, I mean, part, part of this is that the testimony of the applicant is that he has reviewed this with Public Works. They haven't raised an objection or an issue or said what you've done is crazy and inconsistent with our understanding of it. And, you know, public works isn't necessarily going to have a survey uh, of the setback here. Um, so they may be an ex expressing an opinion. And so I guess the question is, you know, are you saying that short of a surveyor opining uh, you know, with a degree of professional certitude that this is in fact where the right of way ends, that you wouldn't be satisfied with the existing pin or measurements that effectively have been given to us. I think what I'm saying is that a clear sign off from Public Works um, approving the, uh, you know, the, the, the waiver, um, mm -hmm. I think is sufficient uh, in you know, mm -hmm. almost the same as an adjoining property owner, you know, in this, in this case. Um, so I think that either or. 
is uh, is you know it's particularly sufficient uh, to whatever the applicant chooses to do. But I, I think one or the other, um, or open to any other ideas. Um, well, we, we we do have what what appears to be a section of a survey. Um, and is that, or do you have the? Yeah, I, I got this from the city engineer. So I went in and I, I got this, which he said was very unique to have the survey. And you're right that the actual front facade of the house isn't absolutely measured here. And I did not only pace it, but I, I also scaled it off this. And so it's possible that there is six inches of, of error here. I, I agree with you because surveying is absolutely technical. The point that I would make in counter to that is that the neighbor's house is six feet more forward. So I'm actually, the argument I'm making is comparative in the sense that I'm saying with the neighbor two feet from the setback and us 11 feet, that us migrating three feet forward relative to the nature of the neighborhood makes the specifics of four or five or six inches less important to me civically perhaps than it does to you technically and I would be as the argument I'm making is that the front porch extending a bit relative to the neighbor makes the specifics of that less important I think to the land to to me than it is perhaps to an engineer and that's where we may but it's both because this is meets and bounds and it is feet so I, I respect your point of view um, I, I, you know I, I don't just uh, think that your measurements are off. You know, I think that they're probably within a level of certainty. Uh, you know, for the purpose of this application, I, I just, um, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, I, I don't see a letter here in the package from Public Works, and would feel much more comfortable if they uh, sort of maybe took a second look at this, um, and uh, uh, we feel more comfortable if this was the process that we sort of use when it comes to, you know, granting setback waivers. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we've sort of already gone halfway there, but. Um, I think that yes, uh, you know, doing a full survey to figure out where that was would be very costly and maybe not um, necessary given the you know magnitude of this horse project. Um, so it, it, you seem optimistic that Public Works has already sort of um, verbally maybe approved this, uh, and uh, so maybe that is the you know the option is to is to get some more formal um, approval for the program. But does would that be? does that technical information worth? The expense, whether it's to the city or the applicant, for a couple inches. I mean, I don't, I don't see the purpose of more technicality helpful at all to my personal decision. And if if you think it is, then I'd love to hear why you think having more explanation makes sense here. Because it's going to be a use of everyone's time, and I don't see the, I personally don't see the value of whether we're arguing about it as much as a foot or six inches. I just don't see how that would change my thought process here. I guess in my, uh, I don't know, I, I, in my professional experience, I'm saying that if those pins don't actually represent the right of way, which I think is a, is a, is a possibility, we could be talking about four or five feet. Uh, you know, it, I think you know, we, we've got a width of a city street. Um, we have not much reference to the other side of this, you know, this, this street. Um, as to where you know the right of way is there, not much reference to the center of the street. Well, I mean, um, you know, how I, do you explain the neighbor are, being? I mean, then you're, you're, are we saying the neighbor somehow encroached on city uh, property? I mean, so, I sometimes I mean, that happens. Yeah. Sometimes that ha we have we have city we have houses where the front porch is technically in the, what is officially the city right of way because it was built there mm -hmm. historically, and then the right of way was expanded or they went oh wait we actually have right of way so we do have that actually happen in the city um i wonder if in this circumstance there could be a, a if, if a reasonable use of time and a reasonable amount of certainty might be created with a condition that said permit issued upon um receipt of a letter from public works confirming that the waiver granted is appropriate well the only i, I was thinking of he's that. conferred with well, right, the one, the one problem with creating writing. a condition subsequent like that mm -hmm. is that what if Public Works doesn't do it? Either doesn't issue such a letter or mm -hmm. issues a letter saying, no, we don't like this. Well, Does that mean then we reopen mm -hmm. the I think, application? I think we need to be careful. Right. And, right. And, and, and I understand that... Um,
there's concern here about this specific <coughs> location of the edge of the right of way. Um, and the question is really one of standards that we would apply for this application or for any application, which is, you know, what evidence is sufficient for us um, versus what evidence, you know, would we like to see? Mr. Uh, Chair, oh. and I'd like, to, I'd like to just expand on my comment. Rob, I really appreciate your, the technical expertise you bring to the, to the board and, and to this application. But really, the setback requirement that we're talking about is more of a neighborhood issue rather than this property issue. And I would think that if we were going to go to the expense of, of a full-blown survey, that would not be a, that would not be the best use of effort from either public works standpoint or from the applicant's standpoint. I don't see that there is a problem. And seeing that we have not identified a problem, I don't see why we're searching for a solution for it. May I just raise one thing that yes. I think we are sort of losing, potentially losing sight of, that is that we're not just talking about any old setback waiver here, mm -hmm. and that you're discussing allowing a setback waiver that is of a greater extent than the maximum waiver allowed per figure 3 06, which I think is what Rob prefaced this with, mm -hmm. and that and that there isn't anything in here. You know, Department of Public Works, when they saw this, didn't really have a whole lot to say. But it may also have been that, you know, they didn't think they needed to explain where the city right of way was because they saw the information that was in here. But maybe just getting a letter of clarification might help. I don't think there's necessarily a discussion about having a full survey done at this point so much as just something from Department of Public Works saying, yep. yes, this is where we believe the city right of way is. Is that where you're I at, Rob? I think a similar type of approval that we see on, uh, on subdivision applications that, um, you know, I don't think we're talking about an investigation in <laughs> the expense. I just want to make sure that uh, there's not plans out there to, you know, redo Frank, Frank, you know, Franklin Street uh, and, uh, you know, we come to a determination and somehow uh, the of uh, unknown uh, location of the right of way and a setback waiver ends up becoming a, becoming an issue. And I think we sort of have a duty through this process to um, prevent that. And that may also have been something where the Department of Public Works just wasn't even necessarily thinking that far down the road. Mm -hmm. If Franklin this. Street were to be redone, that would be a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. With respect to the but if we're 42 way. inches back behind the neighboring house that's 10 feet away, we're certainly not going to impede future yep. development. And, and that is another thing yeah. to consider. It's, 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 it's a bit of a, you know, but, it, but it's also, you know, it's precedent for this street, but also for other streets where you may be trying to grant a waiver that is greater than the maximum waiver limitation, um, which I, I, I hate to say it, but I do know that we didn't allow it on Pearl Street for someone else who wanted to put down the porch. Right. I bet they didn't have a lot as small as this one, though. They had a pretty small lot. It wasn't a coverage issue. It was a setback issue. It wasn't .04, though. It was bigger than this lot, the one on Pearl, Pearl Street. Right. I'm just saying, when I'm not talking, right. Yep. I'm not sure how that happened has any impact on how big the front porch is, if that's usable or not. Well, <laughs> just a pity to one member of the board, I think I, I've got two paths and options, and I think that the, uh, that a letter from Public Works, I don't think I'm asking uh, too much of them. Um, I, I think that it's well within their purview of review of, you know, many applications, and uh, uh, it's just what well, I prefer to make sure Okay, let's set that question aside for the moment and let's talk about the, uh, 
the surface coverage, and we'll circle back to that. Um, so we have very much the same question, and then I think we have a coverage, an, a coverage issue. Um, so at least to the extent that the uh, waiver issues, and just so I can understand, the existing backyard, what, what is there right now? The existing backyard has all of the fences that are illustrated here except the one that goes between the house mm -hmm. and the neighbor's house where a gate has been added. So the clients would like to enclose their yard for their dog. Um, but also because so many houses are very tight, we would like to build a six foot tall fence which is allowed by code and all the other neighbors have them. Right. So the fence is falling all down. So we would like to rebuild existing fence and add that little piece and then the little teeny piece beyond the bay window in the back rendering is new as well just to create closure for the dog. The backyard is all grass and uh, the idea here is in making a new kitchen and adding a door. We just like to have some hard surface outside the back door that made it comfortable to put a table and chair at. And so the amount that is here meets the backyard setback and the side yard setbacks mm -hmm. and it's really not very big it's just the minimum or it's just a small stone patio large enough to kind of use for their family of five so it's um and it's as i said it's simply the idea is simply lay stone on sand on the ground okay so this would just be stone embedded into the into the ground and and the sort of outline here that i i'm looking at drawing a 100 mm -hmm. that seems to indicate sort of a rectangular shape with a path coming out that's the stone yeah the rectangular is straight back and then the idea was just to connect it over to a gate with a path that looked like it would be nice to curve right so it's a four foot wide path that just connects to the opening in the gate okay but then the other remaining areas would remain grass Lands or yeah, some grass type of landscape planted so it's about permeable. Surface. Looks like about one third stone in the backyard and two thirds landscaping, roughly, to me. Okay. So we're going to take this in actually three parts. The first part will be the um, the way the two waiver criteria. Um, so we have those in mind, and I'll just go through that. The question is. Uh, the waiver, if authorized, shall not alter the essential character of the neighborhood district in which the property is located substantially or um, first. And so I think the testimony here is to build a in-ground stone patio in the backyard that does not seem to alter the essential character of the neighborhood. I think we have some consensus on that. Agreed. Substantially or permanently impair the lawful use or development of adjacent properties. Again, this is a development that would be entirely within the property boundaries in the backyard, um, does not seem to alter or affect other neighboring properties. Um, reduce access to renewable energy resources, again, unlikely, um, or be detrimental to the public welfare. Clearly having a fenced in dog area is good to keep the dogs off the streets. Um, the stone being somewhat facetious, but the stone not uh, affecting the public welfare. And then the second uh, waiver criteria is the proposed development of land is beneficial or necessary for continued reasonable use of property. This is consistent with what we've long granted for patios or decks or porches as far as this is the way in which people use their property, which has historically been this way and as, as we moved into the contemporary barbecuing era has continued to be so. Um, so this doesn't seem to be inconsistent with, with that either, unless anybody has any further comments or questions. So then we get into the current degree of coverage. Um, <coughs> and this is a question of, so we're talking about a 5% or 2,000 square foot uh, coverage issue, right? That's the. Well, that's the maximum waiver allowed under Fender 3-06. And just for clarification, the, the stone in the landscaping in the back does not count as part of coverage. Oh, it does. It's, it does. That's it's, why we're here. Yeah. 
it's what? it's it's impervious surface unless they there's a demonstration that that surface allows water to to permeate through it if you have gravel the, on a on a on a uh, soil base Stone. Right. Is it gravel? Or it's, or like it's a stone it's that's porous. on top of it. Can, it it would go by through the cracks, but not through the stone. Oh, we're right. talking about pave, like sort of paver, pavers, paving stones. Stones, so. oh, bigger ones. Stones, yeah. not so stones. Rocks. There, there has not rocks. The, thank you. <laughs> there's not gravel. there is some not level gravel. of engineering that can be shown. There's there's ways <clears throat> to design stone, quote, quote unquote, stone or paver patios, so that it is a permeable surface. And right. I've actually had a separate application come through um, that was an administrative. So for uh, application. We're, we're considering this to be This is impervious based on our definitions okay. of of within the regulations. Okay. Um, unless they can show that it is not. Okay, so and part of this is the way that both the stone pavers and the patio are increasing the coverage issue. Right. So the, the coverage currently is already non-conforming. Non the maximum amount is supposed to be 60%, comes out to 60.1% currently. And then with the patio, it's increased to 69%. But the maximum waiver allowed is 5% are 2,000 square feet more than the district standard. Whichever is less. Right. So So we're stuck at 5%. So the maximum coverage, even with a waiver, based on my interpretation of figure 306 um, and section 1203, is a 65% coverage allowance. Right. And so that it's this, it's the same issue as with the porch is you're you're looking at potentially granting a waiver that is greater than the Sorry. waiver allowed under figure three dash oh six. Um and both of these are increasing current non conformities. Does the board have the ability to to grant things beyond that if the lot is exceptional or not? Or is is that a hard stop? That's a good question. Um, I haven't been able to <clears throat> find that, but it's also not something where we have gone to the city's attorneys to confirm. Yeah, I mean, a 30 um, by 65 lot is a hard lot to live on. There could be a, a there variance is. would not be You know, we, would, we were just talking about the ability of repaving the driveway and introducing permeable pavers, say, down the center. Mm -hmm. um, and doing asphalt here to keep water away from penetrating into the basements and then perhaps introducing a stripe down the middle that would be permeable and Mickey. maybe we could get it right back down to 65 percent and do an exchange yeah. <clears throat> would, it, would it be just as easy would it be just as easy to make some of the back patio area pervious that's a good point maybe so the path maybe the whole path is perme permeable yeah. blocks Mm -hmm. have grass little crisscross right. ones or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah, if there's mm -hmm. enough square footage there. Yep. Right. So. That, that I'm not sure that would get. Do we go from, do we go at 69? Yeah, you got and to. And we have to go back to 65, so that's 5% of lot coverage. You need to get to 1,277 square feet, basically. How much do we need to lose from the total? Uh, about I 100. mean, if, it's, if we're required yeah. to it's, get back. Yeah, it's a, about 100 square feet little less than 100 square feet based on my okay. our sort of joint calculations. So the depth of the driveway could be reduced. So if, if the board would allow us to reduce 100 square feet of permeable, impermeable surface to allow this plan to otherwise go, I would resubmit the drawings with and reduce 100 square feet of the paved area so that it would fit within the waiver for sure. I think that would make sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, part of this is that before we had the waivers, we often did this under a variance analysis. Right. Um, 
I know staff has recommended against a variance analysis here, um, but you know there is that there is that argument, and as an applicant you would be, but this would simply avoid that. Um, and I don't know if you would want to go down that road of variance when you could solve it through engineering. Yeah. And what I would suggest is that that may also solve our earlier setback problem um, where you can resubmit these drawings. Um, you know, what, what I would feel more comfortable with is not necessarily approving this on the basis that you would sub submit these drawings, but to table this to next meeting, have those resubmitted drawings at that time, then also having that response from the Department of Public Works on the front and setback question, and then we could simply, you know, move forward on the application at that time, um, and then we're not dealing with conditions subsequent to a permit. Um, or putting the uh, onus or ambiguity on you. Okay. Um, so we just <clears throat> simply have it in front of us, we review it and, and approve it. I think it's a much cleaner application and it's a much more solid decision if we do it that way. Okay, um, and getting back to Rob's concerns, is it, would, if Tom McArdle said that the setback looks properly represented on the drawings and the additional porch doesn't present any concerns for him is that the level of response you'd like from him or is it I think just to sign off on the waiver itself he does not need, if he doesn't feel the need to get into determining where the front line is then does he sign off on waivers is that in uh, his I purview think he, 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 if, if, making a discretionary decision here to grant a waiver so I think that that's part yeah, of it well of it. it's I, I think it's more him agreeing that this is a representation of where the city right of way is and that Department of Public Works has no concerns with yeah. the further encroachment of the porch towards that right of way. I think that will give you what you need without him trying to dig into waiver language. Right. I don't, I, he's not I, gonna. I he's not gonna. He's he, not gonna put that statement although, forward. I guess I did find another part of the regulations here that may be useful here, um, and that's on page three four, figure three point zero two. Uh, and it's like. Uh, Step back in dimensional standards. There's a note at the top is that if, and I think the second one is maybe most appropriate here, um, is that if the street center line, uh, the setback is from the street center line, the location of the front line is unknown. It will be assumed to be 25 feet from the street center line or half the street right away if the right away is not 50 feet. I, I, I guess. I, it, without an uh, actual determination of where it is, which is, I think, what the information submitted is, I would actually think the regulations say to go to figure 3.02. Right, so, but there's, there's different, depending on the street, there's different right of way widths. Yeah, that's so we would just need, again, from the Department state. of Public Works just to get exactly what this right of way width is right. on the street. I guess another, another option. Yep, another option. I think that, okay. that maybe being in there indicates the intent was that uh, the person setbacks not to have a determination of where things exactly are and there's a yep. out there uh, and so I would be comfortable going that route. Well and, and I mean w one of the things is that you know this is this is sort of tapping into the old common law idea of the width of a road that if there is no way to determine the center line it's presumed to be the the four water four rod wide right of way right i mean that's that's in statute and so this is sort of an but it, at the same time i mean i i'd be perfectly satisfied with uh part public works not diving into the waiver language but essentially saying that they don't feel that this would be a concern for them for their use of Franklin Street or, or any type of maintenance or redevelopment or plans that they have for it, um, as well as that they don't see any significant issues with the way in which the right of way has been represented. That's that would be satisfactory to you as well, Rob? Yeah. Okay. And Ward, you said that this segment of a survey you actually got from Department of Public Works? Yeah. Yeah, so it may also, this whole problem may just be solved if we get the full scan of this that has the key so we know where the right-of-way is marked on this well, because it doesn't have I key. have that in my office and 
it's it's not here yep. because I mean the sheet is bigger, but this is a part of it. The right away line that I got was from um, not from Kurt, the other gentleman. He oh, showed Zach? Zach showed it to me as well. Yeah. And so I yeah derived that from what Jack what Zach. So it's yeah. It's I'm very happy to go in and have them say perfect. my drawing looks proper and they don't have a problem with it. And if there's any issues, I'll bring it back. Or I'll fail to bring back their okay. <laughs> so and that's fine. Okay. Thank you. So if you're comfortable with that, what mm -hmm. we do is we just table it. Uh, this is the July 8th. Are we automatically on the next one? You would be, because yeah. uh, we would we would continue it, so it wouldn't have to be. Okay, and I'm going to be out of the country, so can you can? So then we would go to August. or the or the applicant. I mean the uh, yeah. the actual owner yeah. could present so it as long as. He felt comfortable. I can't remember what day I'm leaving. Well, I think you've all heard the presentation. If we just come back with clarification and a reduction of impermeable, I think it'll be I, hopefully pretty straightforward. I, I I think so. I mean, I think we've done the in essential findings that I'm for the waiver. Colorado. We're both going to be gone, so I could have a. I mean, you want to bump it to August fifth? I'll be here. I'll be here too. Do you want to do that? We're not talking about this in the first phase anyway. We're just yes. in the kitchen. Yeah. I think that's fine. Okay. August 5. So, are you comfortable having a stand in here? Yeah, I won't be here. Yeah, we'll, perfect. I'll be around. Yeah, we'll get out. I mean, I think we've done a lot of the yeah. heavy lifting on this. Mm -hmm. This is really yeah. just clean up. Yeah. Yeah. Unless, yeah. unless other issues are raised. Why don't, we, why don't we put it on the next one, and we'll, we'll get someone here to provide that information. Okay. Um, his wife said she'd be willing to come, and I could also bring a, my, co my colleague could do it, too. So July 22nd. You, Please. Okay. Uh, Just do to I have keep a, things rolling. Do I have a motion to continue this application at uh, 29 Franklin Street to the July 22nd meeting? So moved. Motion by Kate. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Kevin. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion to continue to a date certain, please raise your right hand. You're continued. We'll see you July 22nd. Thanks. Good luck. Thank you. Yep. We're ready for our last <coughs> application of the evening uh, to Sunset Avenue. Howie Michelson is the applicant. And my wife, Allison Mahindy. Okay. So if you just, sorry, sure. state your names for the record. Howie Michelson. Allison Mayany. Okay. If you raise your right hand, which under oath, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the evidence you're about to give for the matter under consideration shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Good. All right. And uh, do we have other people mm -hmm. that wish to provide commentary? Okay. What I'll do is we're going to go through the board process uh, of asking questions, uh, addressing issues. Um, and when it comes time to provide public, public comment, if you still wish to give such comment, I'm going to have to swear you in as well, uh, because this is, uh, you do have to be under oath to provide feedback. And, and just to distinguish, you know, our job here is as a quasi-judicial board to make fact-finding determinations. So we're taking evidence, not necessarily general public comment. Um, and We'll address that at the time if, if need be. It's certainly not as if we have the rules of evidence here that we're going to restrict you, but we do want to make sure that you know people uh, are focused on giving feedback. And I will note that it's about ten after nine. Um, you know, we'll keep this moving forward, um, but being human beings with day jobs, uh, we will we could reach a point at which we may have to continue this. That said. Um, why don't you give us an overview of what you're proposing? Sure. Uh, we um, would like to provide more and more usable parking at our house. Uh, it's currently very constricted parking, as much of the street is, um, as much as Montpelier is. But uh, it, our particular situation is that the driveway is maybe a little longer than 20 feet. Um, there's, a, there's a significant drop off the street, um, right off the street, and then at the 
at the front end of the driveway is our house. Um, it's constrained on both sides by large oak trees. Um, and <clears throat> it is particularly difficult in winter time because we're backing up a fairly steep slope unless we manage to back into the space and it's a relatively narrow street. So backing in, especially if there's snow banks, gets even harder. Um, so we tend to pull in forward and then backing up, especially if the snow plow has come and dumped a bunch of snow on our cars, which are just barely off the street, it, it's, it's a fairly un, unfriendly parking space. Um, so we're proposing to put in a, a separate driveway up the street uh, 25 feet or so, 20, 25 feet. Uh, past the uphill oak tree um, and come around and park next to the building on the north side of the building where in fact there uh, as we discovered thank you very much um, as we discovered as we were kicking around there that that much of that area on the north side of the house where we're proposing the parking was uh, already graveled and some of it was actually paved underneath some of the soil that's there. We, we were coming up with pavement and a lot of gravel, probably a foot thick. Um, so it, in the past, at some point, my guess is that people were pulling forward through the, um, the parking area, uh, through our current parking area to to park back there. Um, we looked at that as a possibility, uh, but we were told by actually two different foresters that if we drove over the roots of the oak tree that's on the north side of the driveway as, on a regular basis, we would essentially kill the tree or certainly disable it pretty heavily. And, um, we're very interested in keeping the trees there. I'm pretty sure the rest of the neighborhood would like to see those na those trees stay there. Um, so, uh, you know, one option, of course, would be to cut one of the trees and expand the the driveway to one side or the existing driveway to one side or the other. But that's not our preference. Um, and so, currently, if we are both home and somebody comes over kids somebody drops off somebody they the the sort of obvious place for people to park at the moment is along the street uh just on the uphills either on our lawn in right in front of the house with because if you park in the street right in front of the house it's very close to the curb the curve uh the juncture between sunset and town and it's, it doesn't feel like a particularly safe place to park in the street. Um, so sometimes people park on the lawn itself, which isn't a great option, um, or park along our side of the street just uphill of our driveway. Uh, we have, when that happens, we have to encourage people to back up some because our neighbor across the street, Judy, needs to be able to pull out. Mm -hmm. And if somebody's parking there, it makes her access in and out pretty difficult. Um, and the other issue is when people come and they drop off, they have to turn around somewhere. There's no place right there to turn around. So they inevitably go to the end of the street and turn around in other people's driveways at the end of the street, mm -hmm. um, which seems like, a, and that happens, any traffic that comes down that street has to turn around somewhere. So. That happens on a regular basis. And so, the, and the final thought I had at the moment is backing out onto the street from our existing driveway, especially when there's snow banks and we can't see near the curve of town and, and uh, sunset um, with you know, not being really, not having good visibility in either direction isn't particularly safe. And it's actually kind of difficult when there's another car in the driveway to have enough purchase to turn before we're already across the street. 
um, so I have to do a K turn often to get out of the driveway and onto the street. That's our interest in having um, the, uh, we, would, we would like to add the parking. It's, we have two kids, they're teenagers, they're like, we're likely to add a car. And we also want to be able to have parking for when somebody comes and visits. Uh, the street is very narrow. People do park on the street often when there's visitors, but it does, especially in the winter, constrain the traffic fairly significantly, although we are a dead-end street, so there's not a ton of traffic there either. So you're, you're, you're not proposing to, repl you, you, you describe that your current parking area is problematic and all the difficulties with using it, and yet you're proposing to add a second one, not to replace the problematic driveway? Um, at the moment, yes. I mean, okay. we'd be willing to consider that. It does mean, I mean, if we're replacing it, I guess we have to tear up what's there, which is, you know, an effort, right. cost. Um, but also, you know, if we're parking in our spaces and s during the summer, particularly, if somebody's coming over and stopping, it, it's not, if there's just one car in that space, it's not particularly difficult. Um, it's when we have two cars and then we try to park three cars in there sometimes and it gets really a little right. ridiculous. I see. Okay. Um, Thanks so, for yes, that. that's, our preference would be to keep the existing space but to primarily use the new parking as our prime, you know, as our primary parking. Okay. One of the problems with that, and I'm sure you an anticipated, I think some of the neighbors are concerned about that, is that it effectively doubles your parking area. You know, you have, you, you now have what fits on maybe it's widest day three cars no it does no. not fit three cars. doesn't fit three cars no um, no unless we park at severe angles no it doesn't it doesn't and, <laughs> and it's just not it doesn't, it doesn't. <laughs> well, it's two car parking you have that and then and then you're proposing this driveway that would effectively fit two more cars right and um obviously one of the concerns of the the neighbors is that that doubles the traffic capacity that your your house is generating um, you know you go from having a two-car driveway you know we'll set we'll take I'll take your representation <laughs> at face value for for these purposes which is you, know, you have a two-car driveway and now you add another two-car driveway um, that's not to say you're necessarily generating those but it, you're creating the capacity for um, whether that be you or the people you sell it to or the people who you sell it to who sell it down the line. Um, that's certainly a concern that, that I would, I, I, think, I think lies at some of the heart of this, um, which is I'm not, I, I certainly understand the, the issue of, of wanting to have better driveway access and I was actually as you were talking I was looking to see it it looks like there's a carport like a one car carport yeah. um, it's but it doesn't narrow. look like you're using it quite as a carport either no um, wood storage yeah. out, outside storage kind of thing and and you're not proposing to use it under this new driveway I mean it would still be car. it's pretty skinny yeah you know so I don't I wouldn't feel comfortable parking in there and then backing out I mean, that, that's the problem is that, you know, we've gone from much skinnier cars to much wider cars. You know, you look at the old old garages, especially those built in the 30s, and they were built for cars that don't exist anymore, these little narrow Model Ts. Um, and so they're functionally insufficient. You know, you, you couldn't park a truck or a SUV in them. Um, or a sedan. Or a sedan, for that matter. We have one. Um, so I... You know, I, I I understand the idea of a new access point, a safer one, for what your for what your concerns are. I guess the, the question is are you is it a is it a non starter to have the existing driveway narrowed? Because that's obviously one specific control that could be put into place which is 
you can you can represent to us, and we can believe you that you'll never use that for more than one car, or one guest. But functionally, it is for more than one car mm -hmm. and more than one guest. And and again, and there, you know, with zoning, that, right? it's not the individuals before us and how good they are. It's what kind of use do we create and unleash on the world? Um, and so I think that's at least one of our, one of my concerns as, as, as a board member is, you know, do we create something that, that sets up the potential for a much more substantial, and that's part of the reason why we don't allow these multiple, um, automatically allow these kind of multiple driveways. Um, I would echo that concern. So, I mean, I, we haven't talked about this, so I'm speaking for myself, but I could easily imagine doing some landscaping to make it pretty clear that there's space for one car there. Um, if we made it so that there was no car access there, that would take, that would take tearing up stuff. That it's, that's an, an expense that I'm not excited about, you know, um, and having a space there is nice for people who are just dropping kids off or something, but um, I, I don't know if that would, uh, so I, I'd be amenable to, I'd be more amenable to limiting this, that current driveway to make it so that it's clear that it's room for one car. Um, uh, more amenable to that than to say we're going to take it out. Um, Okay. Um, and I also would say, if it's necessary, we you know we have contemplated taking it out. It's it's down our list, right? Yeah, I, I don't think it's a problem to take it out theoretically. I just think it's you know in terms of how when when we would take it out financially that you know. That's more of the right. Yeah. And what does it mean to take it out? Right. Well, and 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 part of this is you know we're we're talking at sort of a high level, but it may be helpful to just go s straight into you know the zoning bylaws that we're we're applying here. Um, you know, for everyone concerned, um, you know, when we talk about um, what the access. Of a, of a driveway is allowed and under section 3010B3 it says that um, a lot may be served by only one access point except as provided below and then they they allow certain exceptions a corner lot not fronting on a state or class one highway may have more than one access point on each street provided the spacing requirements as specified below shall be met and B, the Development Review Board may approve more, more than one access on a lot when necessary to accommodate unique physical conditions on the property to provide adequate emergency access or to provide adequate traffic circulation within the site. And so mm -hmm. when, we're, when we're drilling down deeper, we're really not talking about emergency access. There's been no complaints about fire trucks or ambulances being able to access the property. Um, and in part, what we're also talking about, you know, your house is close to the road. So some of the circulation and access things are not as relevant, you know, because this, these bylaws serve properties that are set far back, you know, up on, off of Town Hill Road, those, those expansive mansions um, <laughs> that are served by those uh, long driveways. Right. That's what they're really getting at in some of these things. But, you know, it does talk about unique physical conditions on the property that I think are, are really what you're getting at, which is that this particular driveway, um, with the two cars you have, and then with whatever guests or kids coming over, um, parking, are creating issues, and you want effectively a longer driveway. We want a place to be able to turn around and not turn around into the street. Right. Up a hill. So you're, unless you, unless you, as you said, unless you back into the driveway, you're always, you're always backing out. Okay. Um, 
So let's look at some of the technical issues, at least. Um, Meredith, uh, if I'm understanding the, the staff reports, we're under, are we under the, some of the 45 feet? Right, spacing so that's the other issue. So you okay. have the, the number of access points, and then you have how far this new driveway would be from surrounding driveways. And in pretty much all instances, um, the proposed spacing is less than the minimum, which I think is 45 feet, right? Right, right. 45 feet from the other. Yep. Okay. So 3010 B4. I'm sorry, we, we've worked with this a little bit, but just to increase my familiarity, that includes drive, th that measurement goes for driveways up and down the street as well as across the Correct. street? Correct. has to be 45 feet from driveways, um, uh, I think, but it is, yeah, I don't have the exact language right now. I, uh, I read it as both. It's both? On okay. both sides. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I, I would Adjacent like or opposite driveway or street. That's I harder. would like to point out that I'm not sure there's on Sunset there's any drive that meets that standard. Right, and it's and it's a it is a consideration for when a new driveway is put in to make a determination on. It's really about making sure that you have driveways where you don't have two people coming out and not seeing each other, or other people having to stop in time, and those kinds of issues. And that's why the board doesn't have to go through a whole waiver process, but they can reduce that spacing depending on the site conditions. What street are you on? How fast does the traffic go? Yeah. Um, and, and, and this is a situation where, you know, the Department of Public Works was ready to just issue the permit until I sort of flagged and said, wait, no, there's so many decisions that yeah. need to be made first. So as far as what type of street this is and how fast traffic goes, we're talking about six, seven houses? Uh, eight on Sunset. Eight houses? Eight. Okay. And um, it's probably a 25 mile an hour street. It's probably only 24, 30 feet wide, if that. Okay. So it's a low traffic street. Yeah. It's a low yeah. intensity and of a, use. And a dead end. And a dead end. Okay. Right. So that, that would be something I factor in if, if we contemplate a reduction in that amount. And I don't know that, I don't know if it, how it factors into the, the swirl. But if, if the new driveway alleviated issues with the old current driveway, would, it that, would that make, make it acceptable to reduce the distances between driveways? I mean, as a, there, are some, there are some different goals that could be achieved here one way or another, and is, we're is maybe the, balancing that. Is the plan to, to, is the plan to pave the new driveway? No. no just what, what, what is the surface just, material? Just gravel. No, that's okay. I, I think that was a, a worthwhile addition to the conversation. So, um, you know, and, and I guess I'd further note that, you know, part of the issue here is that at looking at these existing driveways, they're all non-conforming with that 45-foot standard. And it, the way the house is and my understanding of the way the lot is, anything from sort of the, the round end of your house uh, forward, it would be inaccessible because it, there's a steep drop off and yeah, so well, you mean like toward the curb? Right, towards the yeah. curb. Yeah, it doesn't, I mean, both it's, it would take huge amounts of earthwork to make that functional, and we don't own that corner there, that's right. that's town corner, and and it's right on the corner, which seems right. like a lousy so that's, place to put it. That's just a factor that we have to take into account. This isn't, this isn't a problem that you're, you're creating where there's an easy solution, to the contrary, it's really driven in part by the topography and location of the house. Um, okay, were there any other questions from the board? Yeah, I just point? have one side, another sidetrack question. So if you were to or call up an ambulance or EMS or fire and both of your cars are in your driveway, 
how are they getting to your house? They would they're have to just pull up on the, the side, street. park in the street, and park then they're in gonna the have to go pull and turn around in the cul de sac. They would have to, yeah, they'd have to go to well, well they'd, they'd have, have to, to find somebody's driveway to turn around in, yeah. So, I mean, in theory, there's a emergency access issue, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if it's it's quite the one that, that drives, at least in my understanding of the emergency access, it's really when the ambulance doesn't have the ability to go up the driveway as opposed to turning around because it's on a narrow street. It's a tighter turn. Yeah. yeah. No, that, I mean, notwithstanding, that's, that's still a valid point. Okay. Um, at this point, it might be helpful to receive comments from the public. Um, so if you are planning on making a comment, if you raise your hand, okay, and then if you'll raise your, raise your right hand, I'm going to put you all under oath. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give for the matter under consideration shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under a pains and penalties of perjury? All of you? Yes? Good. So the thing I would ask is come to a microphone, state your name. Um, and your address, and provide any uh, any testimony you feel is necessary. And we may have questions for you, so don't don't sit down too quick. I'm Carol King, and I live at Three Sons of Adventist. Okay. Um, yeah. Ms. King, I, I, I have a June 5th, 19, 2019 letter yes. that was addressed to, to, Meredith. to Meredith, but was also copied to various city officials, including Correct. myself. Correct. Okay, so we, have that. We, we do have that letter as part of our packet and it's considered part of the record. Okay, so I have uh, also um, how we had sent uh, kind of a response to that letter mm -hmm. on um, dated June 14th, and I have uh, put some comments into that letter that um, I would like to address and also make sure that you have copies of. So may I pass those out? Sure. Um. And then the other one that I have um, is an, an email from our other neighbor, um, Mary Tolman. And Okay. Well, let's 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 take one at a time, and okay. and just make sure you give a copy to uh, the applicants as well. Um, um, I just wanted to um, one thing in the letter, um, the June fifth letter, that I would um, just try to reiterate with you is that, and you've already brought this up, um, none of the driveways near where this is proposed for meets the forty five what requirement nor does the driveway that they're proposing, I'm not sure that it meets the 100 foot requirement for the intersection of town and, and sunset. So I just add that mm -hmm. little piece of information to, to that letter. Um, You know, we understand what what they're um, up against, but um, we've all had we all have short driveways. We mm -hmm. all have lived with that. Some of us, for over 40 years, have lived with that situation for over 40 years. We've had kids. Kids have had extra cars. We've all done that, and uh, the previous owners of their house, they had three kids. They had three cars in the driveway. And previous to that, there was a renter in there, and they had three cars in the driveway. So it's not an impossibility. I would say that for me, part of the solution would be for them to confine whatever they want to do to within the driveway that exists between their house and the tree and going there. Because personally, I'm not looking forward to looking at a driveway that is literally going to be right out 
across from the front of um, Bob's in my house. It's, it's there. Howie and I have had discussions about this because um, last, a year, a year and a half ago, he cut down probably a quarter of an acre of trees to put in a solar panel. Uh -huh. And I didn't want to see the solar panel from my front yard, from my front window. It's there. I can see it. So I'm not particularly enthused with the idea of looking for at a driveway. Um, the other thing that really concerns me is there's Judy's driveway, there's Howie and Allison's driveway, and then less than 20 feet up the hill, just up the hill, there's going to be another driveway. I don't know whether they plan to use that as a U or as a separate driveway. And, and, and this, this additional driveway, who who owns that? Is that no, another? No, that this is the, the it would be proposed, oh, 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 the proposed, the proposed driveway, driveway that they're proposing. Okay, right, I'm right, sorry. The proposed <laughs> driveway. Um, you know, I don't know uh, the particulars, but why can't they look at going between the tree and the corner of their carport and creating parking up that faces up the hill mm -hmm. um, versus adding another driveway within very, very few feet. Very, very few feet. It's tight. And it's going to be worse having another driveway in there. Um, the other thing is that the driveway is proposed on the rise of Sunset. And um, that presents multiple safety issues because, uh, you know, you won't be able to see coming down, you won't be able to see whether or not they're coming out of their driveway. I have a question about that one. Yeah. Um, we're hearing that there are safety issues already with the driveway that they have. Would these safety issues be worse or better? It sounds like it's already an unsafe situation. It is a, so if we're talking about swapping one situation. out for another, but would this I be would less safe? I suggest to them that they can back into their driveway. Bob and I drop back into our driveway every day both it has of our a dip vehicles on your side too it's we're on we're right across the second house up right across and we back in i'm sorry i haven't been up there does it have a dip coming off the street into your driveway as we've no. heard them to describe no okay we don't but judy has a significant one. Oh, she's on the same side as the street she's on the same side as we are and she has a significant one and for her to get up and over and avoid other cars you know or the potential for vehicles coming down the hill, it's going to be, um, it, you know, it has the potential to be problematic for her. Are the close driveways that exist today causing any problems? Were those causing any problems we, before this we discussion? All, we manage it, you know. Oh, we all manageable. know. The other, the other issue for us is elimination of parking. Um, we can't park on the upslope of, of uh, Sunset in front of our house because it creates a blind spot coming up over the hill. So we often park just beyond our driveway or across the street, either before the telephone pole or after the telephone pole. If they have this added driveway, it's gonna eliminate parking for us. Um, it, oh, you know, it's so a narrow street, it's a small street. Yeah. Thank you for describing it. I'm kind of trying to picture it. So I have one more question for you. Sure. So you're saying that when you, when you park on street, it's on the upper portion of Howie and Allison's property. So put it, they're putting a driveway in would interfere with what people well, have become used to. Well, then it would take to. away any space that we had below on the down rise mm -hmm. of Sunset. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And, you know, I, I worry about uh, people, the rest of the neighborhood, uh, coming down Sunset and having to uh, watch out for another driveway for vehicles coming out of another driveway. Okay. Um, Thanks. I would also just tell you that there's eight houses on the street. Theirs is one. And the majority of the rest of us are opposed to this. We just, um, you know, we have some issues. Um, and I, I just think that, you know, they could think, rethink some of their, their, Possibilities. Okay. 
Well, thank you very much. Was there another? My name is Roberta Garland. I live at um, 10 Wilson Street, which is far away from Sunset. But um, I've been a visitor um, to the home of um, Howie and Allison. Um, I've driven my car up there. I, it's a very hard street to negotiate in the winter. And, um, and not only because it's narrow, but compounded by the fact that at the end of the street, there isn't any place to turn around. It's too bad that there wasn't uh, like a little, uh, an extra space at the end to turn around. You can't turn around. You have to go in somebody's driveway, which feels really bad. Um, and then their, their current driveway, I can't go down there in the winter because I won't be able to get up in my car. So I just don't go there. So where do I park? I park at, you know, where the Culinary Institute used to be. And I walk up, you know, and if somebody can't walk, I have to drop them off. So it's really difficult. And when they described to me their idea of putting in that driveway and having, having parking back there and a place to turn around and then come out, that felt really good. Felt like this is really an issue of safety. It's a really safety concern on that road and that would be really helpful to have that and it would feel much safer. Thank you very much. Ma'am, did you wish to? The property owners of 2 Sunset Avenue, who have already received a variance, plan to construct a second driveway through the middle of their property. The obvious place for number 2 Sunset to increase driveway space, and most importantly, more parking space, is simply to extend the current driveway to the right of the carport and extend the area for more parking spaces. There are several advantages to this alternative, a second large, wide, <coughs> and long gravel path cutting down the middle of the grassy yard and many reasons why a second driveway is not necessary. First of all, I understand that the owners are concerned about cutting down one of several trees that border their front and Sunset Avenue. <clears throat> the neighbors who are challenging the approved variance were informed by the owner that extending the current driveway might compromise the health of a nearby oak tree. I am very puzzled by this explanation. Their entire backyard was recently clear, clear cut of many old <coughs> growth pines and other large trees in order to accommodate a large solar panel. Clearly cutting down one tree to expand the current driveway is not environmentally concerned of the owners. The current owners say there is an aesthetic consideration to cutting down one tree Again, leaving several existing trees, <coughs> excuse me, leaving several existing trees <coughs> at the front border. I am also puzzled by this. Since moving into the property a few years ago, um, we have seen the yard turn into a massive storage site for sets of tires, construction equipment, including oversized hauling trailers, cement mixers, log splitters, bicycles, large piles of boxes strewn about, shelves full of stuff, old furniture, <coughs> which fill up the carport and have spilled into the side of the road and in front of the house. There has been no aesthetic consideration of the property thus far, so I truly question the aesthetic argument of cutting down one tree. It took a year of constant complaining to Howie personally by most residents on our street who begged him time and time again to please clean up the eyesore of a yard, which he finally partially did. Again, this is not against you, this is against the driveway. Um, so with that being said, <coughs> the tree is a non-issue really. Why is the second <coughs> dra gravel path through the middle of the yard? Some months ago, Howie, the property owner, 
mentioned to me that he hoped to store the trailer construction equipment and other property in the carport towards the back of the property. The proposed placement of the second driveway now makes this perfectly clear to me. I believe this proposal is mainly about maintaining access to all of these terms, <coughs> items, and unsightly junk, including access to the construction trailer, as I have also been told by the owner that they would have to uh, they would have to be moved to the area next to my property towards the back of the narrow lot and now I see accessible by the new proposed driveway. Smaller items may be stored in a future basement remodel, but as of now, uh, there is not, I'm sorry, um, but as of now, there is not even outside access to the basement. Adding the second driveway, of course, will also provide more parking as well, but the location seems clearly about having access to the piles and piles of junk, machinery, and construction trailers that will be moved to the back of the new driveway area. The pile has already started right next to my property line to my back deck and visible from the only main window in my living room. There will be visible also from the street. My guess is that there will be large tarps covering this. As tarps have blown off the log splitter already and never even replaced, I think this will end up as another unsightly mess without having the benefit of the carport pool for cover. If aesthetic consideration is granted towards the city backing off of having one tree cut down, let's talk about the aesthetic impact of the proposed driveway. First of all, my assumption that after seeing many dump truck loads of mixed gravel deposited in the yard so far, is that the homeowner has drawn his own plans for construction of the driveway and will not be consulting an engineer or professional constructing constructors in the driveway. Secondly, the road access is at least four feet above grade level of the yard. Therefore, I can only imagine tons and tons of gravel elevated from the street and graded, still elevated into the yard to overcome the steep grade to the street. Will this just be tons and tons of dump truck loads of gravel dumped to a depth of four feet plus the street side? Will there be tons? Um, Excuse me, I have macular degeneration. I have trouble reading. <laughs> um, the property is on a slope from side to side. Has the city considered the erosion of dirt and gravel from this four-foot pile? Then what? More loads of gravel brought in to fill the erosion, spreading <clears throat> the gravel pile that is inevitable without some kind of retention wall? Clearly, an engineer should be consulted and required for this mainly project. In summary, the limited parking problem can easily and aesthetically be solved by extending and widening the current driveway. This solution will avoid an unsightly gravel pile swath of driveway from Sunset Avenue through the middle of the yard, directly in front of the large living room window of the neighbors living directly across the street and next door. And from all of us seeing this yard of grass and shrubs, our tidy and simple little neighborhood turn into what might end up looking more like a commercial construction site. And it goes on and on. I don't have to read it. You get the, get the general um, sure. gist of it. Um, I live directly across, and I have the same problem as Howie with the uh, uh, driveway. You went all the way up and then all the way down on Sunset Avenue. But you just manage it. So that's my, my reading of this. Well, thank you very much. Anyone else? Let me ask a question that I think has been hit upon several times by some of the neighbors, um, which is um, landscaping. Uh, that's not a component of this analysis in a formal way, uh, and, but I did notice in one of the drawings there was a sort of uh, artistic rendering of a large, new large shrub. Um, Where is it? 
Yeah. Both. Is that the only planting that no, you would propose? Was, um, I thought that there was oh. another drawing. Yeah, the site plan, so the next is the last piece of paper in that packet. Oh, here we go. Multiple in blue. Wait, look. That one right there. Right. So, so a shrub, that, that new large shrub, and then it looks like uh, a number of shrubs along the back side of the driveway. So, um, <laughs> there's several things that. Uh, Here, should, can I say something? Please do. So, um, you know, we've uh, we are a family yep. with two teenagers, and we both work full time. Um, and we are very interested in landscaping and having a beautiful ho home and yard. Um, has it taken us a while to get there? It has. Um, we did take down a number of trees in our backyard because a forester came and looked at our lot and said he couldn't feel comfortable uh, sleeping at night knowing that these trees were over our house um, and that they needed to be removed. So many trees were removed that were right up against the house that were lovely that i cried about and did not want them to be removed but those trees were dangerous there's the high winds they were going to crash on the house there was just with those trees you know there was a process of cutting up those trees using a wood splitter to um, make firewood um, and remove the brush and we're still you know, continuing with that process. Um, there's a real difference between what trees were taken down in the back that were, um, and these two majestic oaks that frame our house. Um, and I, I'm surprised to hear the neighbors say that that oak is not something that's a beloved tree in the neighborhood because it's, it's quite old and quite beautiful and quite healthy. And we have been told by two separate foresters that if we continue to because we also wanted to put exactly as she proposed we did want to put just gravel right there we wouldn't have to be here to do that mm -hmm. it was a simple solution and when we had a forester look at it they said your that tree will die very soon um, if you are driving over it so we don't intend to have a circular driveway we don't intend to, you know, we, we want to save that tree. And that is, um, and we want to landscape and we'll, do we have a specific landscaping plan? Not yet, um, uh, but landscaping is really important. We put in plum trees along the back. Um, uh, we're putting in a whole bunch of blueberry bushes. Like, we're, you know, we're doing a lot mm -hmm. to make our yard a beautiful, sustainable Montpelier home. It takes longer. We aren't paying other people. I mean, we are paying a landscaper and a, somebody to do the driveway. That was not something that we were intended to do ourselves. Um, but a lot of the landscaping we're doing our, ourselves. We don't have someone come lower along or anything like that. So, right. Uh, I I think the question about the landscaping is really, you know, we often use it here as a buffer, as a way of softening the impacts of these type of developments because, you know, just a common theme you can hear, um, you know, the, the neighbors are talking about what they see out at their front window. And, and you know, the at the end of the day, we don't get con to control what we see out of our front window. If the school across the street from our house decides to sell it and turn it into condominiums, so be it. That's what I see out my front window as opposed to you know something that I can necessarily control at the same time you know clearly something of that nature then does soften that impact about what people see and you know a lot of times we have this problem with with development projects where the applicant has a vision of it that they try and communicate neighbors though fear the worst you know they don't see the rosy picture they see the ugly scar, um, you know, streaking across what was formerly beautiful pastoral bucolic land, um, and as a board, 
you know, we're charged at looking at a very narrow set. So we're, we're going a little bit beyond. It's not anything we can necessarily require, but I wanted to just plumb the depths of your um, willingness if there was, you know, one of, the, one of the options here for us is to say, you know, there has to be a landscaping plan. Um, more than more robust than um, you know one large shrub and understanding that this is maybe not something where you're going to hire you know the the landscape gardeners to you know put in but you may have to do some of this yourself at the same time you know certainly from from a board's perspective that does mollify some of the impact that um, is created by this, um, so it's it's worth it, it it's worth considering. It sounds as if you're open to that. Um, it, it was our it's our intention actually. But at least to do at it. least the plantings yeah. I'm looking at are mainly behind, and this would be you know so your so neighbors to the side and to the front. Like well, side. yeah. So a few different points. One. Um, I do need to say that the trees that got cut down, there were, there were three popples that were 70, 80 feet tall, which were about 30 feet from the house. Um, that's clearly a, a danger. They were at the, it, so I'm just saying, yeah. there, there was lots of comments about how willy-nilly we've been handling all this. We started this project in the fall. We did leave a mess in the yard for much longer than we should have. The snow uh, came early. As snow <laughs> came early, there was m there, it was just a mess, and um, I things had gotten pulled out so we could do certain things. So there, it was, I can understand the the apprehension of our neighbors in thinking, oh, this is just going to continue on and it's going to become worse and worse and worse. I understand that's not what you are necessarily thinking, considering, but I think that's out in the air, and we need to say that our intention is to have an aesthetically pleasing yard and landscape. Um, in terms of what we're willing to do landscape-wise, we had the intention, well, we, we are hiring uh, someone who does hardscape and roads and uh, landscaping to put in the driveway. We also have talked about with him bringing in very large bushes specifically for screening purposes so and and improvement of aesthetics in that yard um, we are sensitive to Mary's concern that that she's gonna her view is gonna be encroached upon and um, and from you know across the street we we're trying to figure out all this stuff as we go along so we're more than open to working with the board and with our neighbors to make things as aesthetically pleasing as reasonable we're not going to spend a hundred thousand dollars on the landscaping but we will spend some money on it to because we want it to look good too mm -hmm. Can I yep. ask another question? There Please. Other seven. Um, so, sorry to beat this horse, but I, I just I want to fully understand about why that stacking of cars with one next to the old carport and one next to the tree would not work. Because it's if, said, I, I, if you look at the plan, oh, right? I, I'm orienting myself by this picture, and this right. might not even be your vehicle. That is my vehicle. That is your vehicle. So right now it's parked pretty close to the oak, and it. I don't know if it's true, but it looks like it could pull forward pretty easily. So it looks like pulling forward from there would not be so different from what you're currently doing. And I just well, wanna, what do we're currently doing is the historic driveway there, yeah. and so the tree has grown over time, mm -hmm. dealing with this hard-packed spot. Mm -hmm. But it's also, if you look carefully at some of the pictures, right there, mm -hmm. the the roots of the oh, oak are right at the surface between the oak and the carport. So oh, they- Oh, this, in this direction. They extend, I mean, they extend out in all directions, yeah. obviously, yep. but they, you can see the roots coming out here. So in okay. order to do that, we're driving over a significant portion okay. of the main 
body of the roots. Okay, that's helpful because when I was thinking of the roots and the cars that might drive over them, I was thinking just of those roots between the oak tree and the parking area, but you've just told me that they go forward well, they, toward yeah, the they, house. They it's, 360 it's tree. degrees around. Okay, that's a good, that's a good addition, um, and it sounds like you're trying to take better care of the tree than has been done in the past. Um, well, I, I can't speak to that, but we are trying to do what we can to save the tree. Yeah. It's an old tree, and we're not, we don't want to see it go down. And it's in good condition. I mean, it's, it's not like it's an old tree, and it's going to go soon anyway, sure. so, you know? Yeah. Like, it's, um, it's, uh, it's in great shape, and we had, a, you know, we had an arborist look at it, and they're like, yeah, these trees are going to be here for a while mm -hmm. if you take care of them. Okay. All right, thanks for providing that one additional bit of information as we've talked about that a lot. I just wanted to fully understand it. You know, and part of understanding as well your, your stomach or capacity for a landscaping plan is that if we did put it into the application, it would carry the force of a law. You know, it would be a condition of your permit. Um, failure to follow your permit is an result in a notice of violation kind of you know so I'm less concerned about the past practices I understand you feel the need to re respond to them because they have been levied in a public forum um, but at the same time you know that's part of why we're here to examine this is that what we render as a decision does carry the force of law um, and does does have certain teeth to it so you know it, and at the same time, that's also why I want to understand that, you know, if we do put a condition on, you know, if we do grant a permit, we don't intend it to be a, a poison pill permit. Um, we either grant this permit or we don't. Um, and the conditions are intended to address some of the issues and, and direct some of those concerns. Okay. Um, were there any other comments from any of the audience? Sorry, I have another question. You have a, this is a question for you, actually. Okay. Um, if once a condition is put on a permit, how, how much time is there for the person who received the permit to implement the condition? It doesn't have to be done the day they get the permit, no, right? Two years. No, you have two your years. standard two year life of the permit with the option for a one year extension, mm -hmm. presuming that everything that they've done so far is in compliance with the decision in the permit. So you could do the gravel one year, you could do the landscaping another year, you could do get an extension and do more landscaping a third year. Correct. Okay, so in terms of for, for, for budgeting, including time budgeting purposes, I just wanted to put that out there. The, the, the question I would have is in, in terms of putting landscaping into the permit, mm -hmm. our intention would be to do landscaping in conjunction with what happens and sort of do it in in a way that works and is aesthetically pleasing both to us and our neighbors. And it's a little, I mean, we could spend a bunch of time and money having a, a landscape architect do up a full plan, um, but I don't know how, I don't know what you would be stating as part of the permit, how you would state the landscaping requirement. Well, that's actually a very good question. Um, and actually, it was one that I was considering while we were sitting here, which is there are a couple of different options. Um, uh, one option is you've heard what your neighbors have said. Um, you can go back and you can, you know, you've already engaged with a landscaper to design and develop this driveway and it sounds like he may be providing some landscaping advice based on what you've heard as well as a sort of a report you know a, an indication from at least a few board members that landscaping might be a way to, to help some of these issues you could go back and create a, a more robust sort of landscaping plan to address some of the screening not that and and I think what Kate's question and Meredith's answer was really, you know, you. it's not something that you have to, if you're granted a permit and the condition is in, install this landscaping plan, that you have to do it this summer. And, you know, whatever budget you had for fall vacations is gone into barberry bushes. 
but um, you know you have three years at the outset, or at least two years. Um, you know the idea is that, you, but the idea is that you you would commit to a specific landscaping plan, and that may make the most sense. Which is, talk to your landscaper, talk amongst yourself, you know, figure it out with what makes sense for you, and come back with a landscaping plan that says, you know, here's here's what we do will do to address screening along the front of sunset, screening along the side. I mean, you know, one thing that certainly you would want to be concerned about, and this is. We don't design these plans. I mean, we can certainly put in a landscaping condition, and if I had to close the record tonight, you know, I have some idea of language, but I think your point was, do you, you know, what, what is the condition? We may have some ideas. It may be better to give that an opportunity to do so, as opposed to us imposing upon it, because there's also the question of, you want to make sure your site distances are, when you're exiting the driveway, are not impeded. So you don't want to put a bush right there at the corner that grows up to block the driveway. Right. Um, you know, we're sensible to that. Uh, but you do want to create something that breaks up this driveway from, n not from your perspective, but from other perspectives. Um, if that's the route you want to go. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't laugh at the yeah, you'll need to come up to the yeah. microphone. And just so reintroduce yourself. Um, I, just, I, I just suggest that for either side, just go take a ride up there and look for yourselves at the property instead of looking at it on a piece of paper. It'll mm -hmm. be much more, it's just right up the street. Sure. Um, yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> we don't. a very good idea of what it is. At, at this late hour, we're probably not going to be doing I don't mean it. now. I mean, yeah. <laughs> during the week. Um, earlier this evening, I heard you mention a few um, qualifiers, if you will, um, regarding some of the other proposals that came before you. Um, one was, uh, is it going to have an adverse effect on the neighborhood? Yes, it is. Because it's going to create safety issues, not only for Judy, but for people coming down and going up the hill. Does it work for our neighborhood? No. It doesn't. It is without, it is outside of the character of our neighborhood. None of the three, none of the uh, homeowners in the three streets that are in our area, North College, Town, and Sunset, nobody has two driveways. There's one driveway per unit. So it's out of the character of our neighborhood. And it doesn't work for our neighborhood. So I just, those are some things I heard, and I just wanted to bring uh, sure. to your attention. Well, well and I, I, I appreciate that, but I do want to be clear that, you know, our analysis is driven by some slightly different standards. The undue adverse impact was for a very specific area where the bylaws use that language, um, as opposed to this. This is, um, it's an interesting question because it's not, um, it's not one in which there's a great deal of governing language. Uh, so character of the neighborhood, um, even aesthetics, are not something that are necessarily triggered by this. This is really just a very simple question of whether or not you know this second driveway is allowable under the under the language that um, that I cited before under 3010B3. And so, you know, to a certain extent, when we get into issues like aesthetics, you know, we're, we're trying to create, you know, a way of answering certain concerns in a, giving legal, legal answers to concerns that aren't necessarily covered by the statutes that the applicant's willing to engage in. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, I, I just want to be clear that if we don't engage in an undue adverse impact analysis, it's, it's in large part because the bylaws don't call for that. Um, they call for different. I understand that, but I heard the terminology oh, used sure. tonight. And so, you know, I, I just want to get my point across. I, I, the, other, the other thing I would point your attention to is the note at the end of the pages with the red 
really the most important consideration here is whether or not it meets the, the driveway separation standards and how the proposed location is going to impact one sunset and three sunset. That's really, and in addition to that, my continued concern about the safety issues. Yeah. Thank you. So how does the applicant wish to proceed? Do you want to, so let me give you three options. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so one option is to say, we've made our case, we've put on the evidence we wish to, the, we'll put it to the board, effectively close the record. Uh, the other option is to say, table this, continue it to July 22nd, we'll come back with additional information that we think is relevant for you to consider, um, you know, specifically uh, on the landscaping questions. Um, but certainly the record would be wide open if you wish to put any other further testimony on. Um, and then the third option is to say, I've been persuaded by the neighbors. I don't want to do this. Um, you know, and, that- And come back if you want with a separate Right. Uh, plan to do something different and that might not come here it might be administrative <laughs> it's not so going to be very the, satisfactory the question is go back to you I guess um, okay so we we would um, we understand the well we understand the aesthetic concerns much more easily than we understand the safety concerns we don't understand the safety concerns really and and you know, I've heard the explanations. I've tried to give my explanations. I'm not sure there's going to be a meeting of the minds on that one. I understand, and and that's a lot of times in these applications there isn't. There's, you know, um, the neighbors have a very strong position, and you have a very strong position uh, of what you see is the reasonable use for this property, and you know our role is ultimately to apply the bylaws um, so you, you know I, I've we've heard testimony about the safety from both sides um, you know we, we, that's part of our, our analysis I'm not necessarily inviting you to make more testimony the only thing that I, I, I saw that there primarily could be added would be a more robust landscaping plan which you're already saying in our minds we, we see that what I'm suggesting is that option number two would be, well, okay, come back in two weeks with that robust plan on paper so that we can add it to the, you know, if there is a permit granted, we would add it to that and make it a condition that would have some force of law to it. And we're happy to do that. Uh, we're happy to do that. My concern is that that's not gonna help um, the, the neighbors feel better. Right, I, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the, these are tough. Look, you have to live across the street from each other, um, and this is really difficult on both sides. Um, you have to sit here and listen to allegations that you've not taken care of your property well, and you know, the neighbors have to live with the idea of what are they doing to what I see outside of my window, and you know, why can't they do as we've done, and why do they have to create this that disrupts the neighborhood and the character of the neighborhood and the, the nice, neat street that we have? Both valid concerns. And that's essentially why you have a disinterested board of, well, tonight we're down to five, but usually we're at a, a, a seven member uh, capacity. Um, and that is, you know, that is the difficulty of zoning. Um, and unlike, litigation where the people will sue each other and then never talk to each other again regardless of the outcome you have to see each other and you'll have to wave to each other as you come in out of the street so you know I know it's difficult and the question is you know does this make it a better application if you take those two weeks to take this landscaping plan whether it mollifies the neighbors or not I mean it certainly goes to some of the voiced concerns about aesthetics, and it does seem to um, make it a better proposal. Um, is it worth doing? That's ultimately your decision. Um, so we can certainly we can certainly table this for two weeks. 
um, or we can close the record and move into a deliberative session about it. Um, you know, those are those are two valid options. Which, and just so that you're aware, a deliberative session would mean that the record would be closed, everybody except for the board members and staff would leave, and the board members would discuss it and make a decision in private that would get released when the written decision came out. Right. I mean, that's 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 essentially we can we can move to a decision, you know, and, and it's really you know, your choice. And like I said, with the landscaping, it isn't, the reason we can do this, you know, as opposed to the prior application where we sent them away and said, come back in two weeks. You know, the landscaping really isn't uh, the same essential part of this. I think it makes it, I think you've heard from several board members, myself included, that it makes it a better application, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't, it isn't one of the core fundamental elements uh, of what you're doing. And I would also say that if anybody can come up with a different plan that mollifies everybody, we're more we're, we're more than open to that. We don't we don't want to upset you guys. That's not our intent. Um, and and we just can't come up with a different plan that would be better. Um, and so this is what we came up with. And if somebody has a better idea, we're more than open to taking that into consideration. And, and we came up with this idea from prof with professional um, advisement. It wasn't like we just came up with the idea. We've been right. sitting on this for more than a year mm -hmm. and thinking about it very, very thoughtfully. So. Sure. And, and, and look, this is um, another point, and this is probably superfluous, but I'll say it nevertheless, which is everybody's home is probably the biggest investment outside of some mutual or trust fund or IRA that may or may not exist. <laughs> our house is our primary asset. It's also the thing we occupy every day. And so people care very strongly about their homes on both sides. And so, you know, it, that's what's really been articulated here. Um, and so, you know, I think that's probably a, a good decision. Um, so I will take a motion to table this application Mr. until Chair. July 22nd. Mr. Chair, I will make that motion to table the uh, application um, for six to, to Sunset uh, Avenue to our next uh, planned meeting July 22nd. July 22nd. That's okay. So second. Rob has, Rob second, then discussion. I, I, I think you know, that's clearly what we're looking for is a landscaping plan. However, when the record's open, it's open. So if there is additional information that should come up, I don't feel it's fair to partially close the record. Um, no, knowing, however, that uh, I, at least as one board member, I can state that I'm, I'm satisfied with the testimony I've received from both sides uh, on the other issues, that this is really, this is the sole reason. and. Let me maybe make another suggestion too in the discussion, which is that um, you know there was an invitation by one of the uh, neighbors to just drive up there, um, and certainly as board members we can do that. However, I would caution and all of us, and certainly uh, remind us, but caution the applicant and the neighbors that we can't have ex parte conversations. So if you see one of us coming up there, ignore us, um, <laughs> even if we're doing donuts in your lot. No, I'm, uh, but. Uh, you know, we can't have conversations outside of this hearing, um, but we may come up in this two weeks and just look at this to get a better sense of, of the site. I mean, it's a beautiful house. It's a beautiful neighborhood. Um, you know, this is, this is really a special area, and you can tell that a lot of people feel very strongly about it. So, uh, you know, it's not unreasonable to have us do those site visits. Okay. Um, and, and if for some reason you can't attend the July 22nd continuation of the hearing, you may submit further written testimony to me, and I can bring it to the hearing on the 22nd. But certainly, having attended, this will have. This is the this this hearing. Right, but just if they have additional comments right. they want to put in. But everything all. submitted up to this point is on the record. Yeah, correct. Correct. Yes. Everything submitted up to, to this point is on the we record. We won't have to redo. Submit. No. Right. No. But if there's new information that you want to so provide have, and you can't come on the 22nd, you can just right. send it to me. We have a motion on the table. All those in favor of the motion to continue this to July 22nd, please raise your right hand. 
All right, we will continue this till the July 22nd. Um, again, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for thank you. the application as well as the comments, and uh, we'll continue this in two weeks. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Uh, other business, as we've said several times, that our next regularly scheduled meeting will be Monday, July 22nd, 2019. Do I? Yes. Mr. Chair, um, I want to let everyone know that there will be an application on the 22nd I'll have to recuse myself from, so we will need to bring in an alternate. That's the 9 Bailey Avenue application that may be coming. That That's, is that for the 22nd? No. Oh. I don't think they're on the 22nd. Okay, they think they are. I'll, I'll double check. Okay. Okay. Uh, Never mind. Yeah. We do. I'll let you know. We, uh, Ryan should be back, um, and actually Claire, we spoke with her, and she will be able to attend the twenty second. Okay. And then Michael, if you're able to attend as well, that should bring us back up to our close to full complement. Yeah. Okay. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Motion made by Rob. Do I have second? Second. Second by Kevin. All those in favor of adjourning, please raise your right hand. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much.